John chats with Kendra and Kat. Just a couple of girls talk about this and that. Get familiar with Blue and the charmed ones too. John chats. Well, hello there. Hi. Hi. Welcome to Charm Chats with Kendra and Kat. What? What? Yay. We're Blue such is, dorks. Blue is currently wrapped up like a burrito. Yes, he is. If he were a cat, he would be a burrito. Yes. But he is not. He's a burrito. I guess, but he doesn't really growl much. No, he doesn't. And he's also being a squirmy little burrito. Blue, stop squirming. We're trying to record a podcast. So, we are at episode 113. Which is appropriately all about Friday the 13th. Uh-huh. And the 13th episode on Friday the 13th. That's why it's appropriate. Boom! Mind that's, blown! That's, yeah. That's why it's appropriate. Yeah, yeah. And You it explained aired. my appropriateness. I did. I did. I had to cut you down a little. Why? I've been cut down so much this week. <laughs> I don't know. So it's called From Fear to Eternity, and it originally aired on February 10th, 1999, which we said that these were aired on Wednesdays. Yeah. Which means that it wouldn't have had a Friday the 13th. It would have been Friday the 12th. Which is kind of sad. Oh, darn. But, you know. Oh, darn. I'm not sure they would have wanted quite that much of a convergence. Though it would have been kind of awesome. It would have been hilarious. Yeah. And the, the title, From Fear to Eternity, is based upon the movie From Here to Eternity from 1953. Mm-hmm. In case you were wondering. Nobody ever is, but, you know. Who was in that movie? Me asking the difficult questions. Burt Lancaster, and Montgomery Clift, and Deborah Kerr, and Donna Reed, and Frank ah. Sinatra, and Ernest Borgnine, and a bunch of other old people. Some dead, I presume. Yes. At least a few. So we start our episode with a night overhead shot of a street, and then the front of a shop, which I love, love the name that they came up with for this bookstore. Mm-hmm. This occult shop thing. It's called Coven of Books. Yeah. And I just love it. Like, I kind of want to own a store called Coven of Books. Okay, I'm clearly not getting the entire joke. Or maybe it's, it's just funnier to you than it is to me. It's an occult store. I know. For witches. Yeah, okay, I get that. Called Coven of Books. Okay, I was expecting it to be more of a play on words. No, it, no, it really isn't. It was just, I just loved that. I just thought that was funny. I thought it was going to be like a... A Parliament of Fools sort of deal, where fools is spelled like owls. Parliament of Fools. Mm, yeah, no. I don't know. And then inside said Coven of Books shop, we get a clock that says 11.55 p.m. And I'm sure Kendra noticed, as well as I did, that the clock has four eyes instead of an IV. Yep. We all know how Kendra feels about it. Yes, we do. Mm-hmm. I fucking hate it. Yes. There's also, like, large dots over the four and the eight, which was a little odd. Like, they look like like rivets, kind of. Okay. I don't know. It was weird. Like, I just, I didn't understand. I didn't that. that was a very loud snort, Blue. Mm-hmm. I just didn't understand why. Why? Like, what stylistic choice? Why? Why? They... why? 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 Five very excellent questions. Yes. I just didn't understand, like, the logic behind that particular stylistic choice on that clock. But, you know... Whatever. And the, I, I always love the way that I write things down in my notes because I'm, as I'm like watching the show, I'm taking my notes. So this is what I have in my notes. The shop lady is a redhead with random braids, you know, so you know she's quirky. She's in some kind of weird floral patterned vest thing over a black shirt and a pink skirt. And before she even has a line, I fear for her life. <laughs> like, yep, sounds about right. So, we don't find her name out until the very end of the scene, so I'm not going to say her name until we get there. I made a note about that, too. Okay, we'll get there. So, she says she's getting ready to close, and we see Prue and Phoebe looking at tables in the shop. Prue is wearing a white zip-up hoodie with front pockets, and what looked to be a fur-lined hood. Yeah, yeah, fur-lined, and there was a drawstring. Yeah, and black pants. And Phoebe is in her leather jacket over a purple high-neck top, and it looks jeans. blue to me. It was purple on the DVD. Mm. Like, super purple. And jeans, which I thought were black pants until they actually go outside, and then I was like, oh no, it's her cuffed jeans, but, so yeah. Prue says that she thought the store was open till 1am, 
And Shop Lady says that it normally is, but on the eve of Friday the 13th, she wants to be closed by midnight. So Prue says they won't be much longer, and Phoebe asks for input on an item from the table, which was like a little A little coin like, good thing. luck coin. Yeah. And Prue says that it's nice and tries to get her to go, but Phoebe questions her choice of words and wonders if she should look for another one. Okay, like, yeah, it is purple. Yeah. Oh, and, okay, thing about Prue's sweater, the drawstring... Oh, the, the hood is fur-lined on the outside. Well, no, it would have been on the inside of the hood. Yeah, but, okay, the way the drawstring is, see, the drawstring is going around closest to her neck, so that's the rim of the hood. Oh, so then it's fur The fur is on the on outside. The edge. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's funny. And also, Phoebe's sweater matches that purple beaded hallway behind her. Mm-hmm. It's hilarious. Yeah. Okay, let me take a look at these uh, rivets on that clock face. Yeah, it's like in the very first shot. Yeah, those are interesting. Yeah, it's weird, right? Like, it cuts off the four and the eight. Yeah, that may be a design thing, or it could be just to hold the face on. Also, these are, look at these fucking cherubs. I know. Fucking cherubs. Next to a knight's helmet. Because, you know, quirky. And a calculator. Mm-hmm. Quirky. With this weird-ass floral wallpaper and a random ostrich feather. Mm-hmm. W.T. fuck. <laughs> yes. But yeah, so... As Phoebe is wondering if she should find another good luck charm, the shop lady once again glances at the clock behind her and Prue tries to rush her again. And Phoebe says that choosing the right good luck charm is a very big decision. And we get a cute sister moment um, where Prue if, says... If they're all good luck, what's the worst that, that could happen? happen if you choose the wrong one? Yeah. And then Phoebe comes back with, this is why I like shopping with Piper. And then gets like, okay, fine, let's Prue's, go to the register. Prue's being a good customer and trying to be like, oh, she wants to close up. Phoebe, let's get the fuck out of here. Yeah. And, you know, you and I have both worked in retail. Yeah. We know. We don't always get good customers like that. Some of them will walk in five minutes before closing and stay mm-hmm. for 20. Exactly. And some of them will walk in as you're walking to lock the, the doors. Door. And be like, oh, but it's not yet. And we're like... Well, we're locking one door, so we can lock the other door when the customer is currently in or out. Yeah. So we can leave. So we can fucking leave. Yes. So fucking leave. Yes. Absolutely. Because then we still have to, like, clean up and uh, count down the drawers. It's not returns. It's, you know, whenever the... Well, it depends on your job. I I don't remember what we called it at World Market, but uh, it was just basically, like... Restocking. Type of thing. Not restocking exactly, just like making sure everything is in its place again. Mm-hmm. So like anything customers left at the tills gets put in like a big ass cart, and several times during a shift, like someone will come back and that's their job to take the shit in the cart and mm-hmm. put it where it's supposed to go. Yeah. And so we have to do that at the end of the night and go past every fucking shelf and make sure there's not anything out of place because yep. if you the manager face comes the in, in the morning, facing. That's what. Well. Well, that's just making them look pretty. It's not the actual putting back of the stuff as 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 it was when we called it. Like, there was a specific word. I don't remember what it was. Okay. But anyway, like, if the manager comes in in the morning and sees a random thing out of place, shit's going down. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. Yeah. Because it's like, during the holidays, you're open until midnight. You don't go home until two. Yep. Everyone in that goddamn store. Yep. Everyone. God, I remember working at the video store, and you wouldn't think that a video store would be like a huge draw on a holiday, and yet. And yet. And yet. I remember working Thanksgiving by myself, a 13 oh, yeah, hour shift. That. Yeah. I don't know. I think that was the hallway. I didn't hear a door. Nor did I. Hmm. But yeah, I remember working a, a 13 hour shift at the video store and being by myself for that 13 hours. I had somebody with me for the last two. Mm-hmm. And that was because I was legally obligated to have someone with me mm-hmm. because I could not close by myself. But I remember kids running around and they knocked an entire shelf oh, no. of movies. Yeah, it was, it was bad. Sucks. And it literally had to stay there for like two hours it would just shell like movies all over the floor because i had to deal with the register i could not go fix it it was bad so anyway they walk up to the counter and hand the charm to the shop lady who asks if they wanted to put it on piper's order and phoebe says that she'll pay separately which gets the customary cash or charge from the shop lady at which point then phoebe turns to prue and says hey would you put this on your card i'll pay you back this is for the job so i can get the money to pay you back exactly for all of the things. Exactly. And Prue asks how much the charm is, and she's told that it's twenty five fifty plus tax. Prue seems to be okay with that, but that just seemed a little bit pricey to me. 
Yeah, and wouldn't the price have been on it for Phoebe? Like, does Phoebe have no concept of money? Yeah, I don't know. Though, I don't I don't think she has no concept of money. I don't know why I think that. Um, I'm sure there's evidence in the show. I just can't think of any right now. <laughs> but this Ca- just seems California's like California's always been more overstep. expensive. Yeah. So, like, I, I kind of... But that expensive? It's a coin. It's a fucking coin. But it's a good luck charm from an occult shop where everything is marked up. But it's a coin. But the shop lady does mention they and can apparently get it's a trick 10% coin. off if she signs up for the mailing list, which gets Phoebe to quip that they have good luck already. And she starts to write down their names. And the pen that she uses to write down the names on the mailing list is covered in stones and crystals. And my very first thought was, that must be uncomfortable to hold. Yes. And we get a, like, a, Phoebe picks up the pen and is like, see, good luck already. Yep. And kind of, like, flips over in her hand. And then we see the shot of her writing. And you see, like, there's a bunch of names on the list. They're, mm-hmm. like, right at the bottom, pretty much. And she's holding it. And all of the crystals are, like, facing up. Uh Uh-huh. Um, towards the top of the page. And then the bookstore lady turns around, glances at them, and then goes, Hey, you know, we've got a Wicca group, and hands them a flyer. Uh Uh-huh. And Prue's like, what makes you think we'd be interested? And she's like, oh, well, most witches are. And then... We never said that we were witches. Yeah. And then the lady turns back around, and they're like... Did he he know? How how would she? And then the next shot is Phoebe continuing to write on the sheet... With the pen facing the same way. And we're like, gee, writers, I think you could have been a little more obvious with this. Or, not writers. But, like, you know. Yeah. Like, it was pretty obvious how she knew. Yeah. Love like, it. it's the pen. She looked at the pen. And they're like, how did she know? Shot of the pen. I wonder how. It's like, thanks for being subtle. Yeah. But my favorite is the insert shot for the flyer. Has the words, Spring Equinox, written in all caps with little leaves on each letter. Mm-hmm. It's super cute. And the address... The Spring Equinox wouldn't be until March. Because it's usually around the 22nd, isn't it? Yeah. All equinoxes are the 20, 21st, 22nd, depending. Yeah. Yeah. So, there's got to be another Wiccan... Aren't there, like, eight Wiccan holidays or something? I don't know. Another spread out through the year. Yeah. Because there's the equinoxes and the there's... solstices. Yeah. Uh, that's four. Yeah. And Samhain. Uh, Samhain. Um, Which is spelled Sam Hain. I always want to say it like I that. Always, I, it depends on who I'm with. I sometimes will just because I think it's fucking funny. Yeah. It's like, well, are, I mean, are you doing anything for Sam Hain? <laughs> <laughs> I'm buying him new underwear. <laughs> yeah. um, no, like there's other things that yeah. I mispronounce on purpose. Yeah. All the fucking time. Biscetti. Biscetti. Runny Babbitt. Tarjay. Yeah, well. Everyone says Tarjay. Uh, well, I do it ironically. Like, no. come on, cat. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. I'm not that kind of white person. I am not a pumpkin spice latte person. I'm not a pumpkin spice anything person. I don't really even like pumpkin all that much. Though I will be making my pumpkin bread for Thanksgiving, like I always do. Would you like a loaf of pumpkin bread? Fuck hell yeah. Okay. Fuck hell yeah. What? You know. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, the address on the little flyer thing is a fake address. It is a street it is. that doesn't even exist. I think we get a couple of those. Yeah. Well, at least one more I know we get for this episode. Yeah. So as for, for them, you know, saying that, you know, do, do you think she knows how could she thing? I wrote in my notes, I don't understand why they haven't realized that Wiccans call themselves witches. And since they're in an occult store, that the shop lady might have assumed they'd be into this sort of stuff. Especially since we know that Piper has been there and placed an order of some kind. Well, okay, that's one clue. But uh, very, it's very evident, like, how she specifically found out. Because it's obvious, you know, from future events, that not everyone on that mailing list mm-hmm. is a witch. Yeah. It's kind of obvious. So there's got to be some vetting process for the store owner to be like, Hey, want to join our coven? You want in? <laughs> for her to open the proverbial trench coat. <laughs> join the coven of books. Hey, kid. We got smudge sticks. <laughs> but yeah, so as they're getting their things together to leave, the clock starts to, to chime yeah. the hour. And, and then, the shop lady tells them to please hurry. So instead of hurrying, Phoebe asks if there's a problem. Well, also, and, like, they were to the point where they'd paid and she was putting it in a bag. And then she tells 
them to hurry. Well, because I think because Phoebe was still writing on the mailing listy thing. That's fair. That's the only thing I can think yeah, of. Yeah, that was probably Even it. though it didn't look like she was still doing that, it looked like they were well, just the, chatting. The immediately previous shot was her continuing to write. Right, but Which, yeah. granted, might have been a recycled shot from... Oh, it probably yeah. absolutely was, yeah. And then the shop lady reminds them that she wanted to be closed by midnight, and Prue thinks that she takes this Friday the 13th stuff seriously, to which she says that they should too, especially this one. And there were handshakes, for those of you who do not have the visual. Yeah. And Phoebe asks why, and we get some exposition time, which, you know, she wants to be out. The clock is already chiming midnight, but she's going to tell us all about why. Exposition time. Yeah. She says that once every 1,300 years, there's a universal convergence of negative energy on Friday the 13th, and this is that year, which gets a lovely, of, of course, course it, it is. is, from Prue. And in that moment, we were the same. Yes. Now, according... 1,300 years on a nine? Well, but remembering that we are in an alternate universe because this aired on the 10th, which was a Wednesday. No, which I mean there the, wasn't year, going to be... the year ends in nine. Right, but that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Is this can't actually be taking place in 1999 because there is no Friday the 13th in the month that they are in. Okay, that's fair, but still, like... Well, even if it wasn't supposed to be February in the show... Yeah. Uh huh. Sure, I didn't think of that. It could have been another month. Sure, I. I did Which not then think would of that. make the wait? Was there a Friday the Thirteenth in March of ninety nine or possibly January? Hold on, because that would make sense. I shall look. Either way, it's still technically winter because they're clothing. There is no Friday the Thirteenth in January or February or well, no. See, because there is no Friday the Thirteenth in February, there is no Friday the Thirteenth in March. Oh right, yeah, because nine leap year. The next Friday the Thirteenth. Probably Would October? have been in August. August, okay. So yeah, nope, alternate universe. No yeah. Friday the 13th that year. Yeah. But still, I mean, it's just a gimmicky thing. Yeah. It's it's just really funny to me that it would be, oh, yeah, sure, it's every 1,300 years, but we don't start on a nice round number. We start on a fucking nine. Well, but I, I, or I, I, kind, of, I kind of understand that logic of it's it's every 1300 years from the first time it happened. So if it, the first time it happened it wasn't on a round number. Also like 1300? Yeah. Well, you know. See, you could you could change around the variation by going every um thousand thir- even. 13 cycles of some sh- make up some shit. Yeah. I know. Every 13 years even or, would work ooh, more. Oh, you could use some planet like every 13 cycles of Pluto. Except they wouldn't have fucking known about Pluto, so that wouldn't work. Ooh, no. Saturn. I was going to say, and I don't think Pluto has Ooh, wait, made wait, wait, one, wait, 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 so... Wait, 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 Hang on. And Pluto um, isn't even a planet anymore. Lou, what are you doing? I'm trying to explain cycles. You don't have any of those, because you're a boy, and you have no balls. <laughs> anyway. You barely even have circadian rhythm. There's a snoot. Okay, so... But yeah, every 1,300 years... Yeah, uh, I don't know. year has not been constant. True. And that there's a reason why October begins with eight. It's because it used to be the eighth month, guys. Yeah, yeah. And then we added a couple. We did indeed. And then we changed calendars. Yep. So fuck it. Yep. Now, according to the goof section of IMDb, not sponsored, there is no recorded evidence of any superstitions regarding Friday the 13th before the 19th century, and most reasons for claiming the day is unlucky go back to the Last Supper of Jesus. Now, since that time, there has only been one full cycle of 1300 years, so it would be impossible for such a pattern to exist. According to written history... Mm Mm-hmm. And according to whoever wrote the goof in this particular episode... But as the shop lady stops talking, the clock has finished its chimes, and she tells them that it has struck 13, so it's starting already. Oh, no! Yeah. And as they grab their purchase to leave, Phoebe says, Good night, Tangela. Tangela. Now, in my notes, I go... Like Tangelo, but with an A. Yeah. So I wrote in my notes, I went, Oh, she's been given a name. I knew it. She's doomed. Yep. But let's talk about this name for a second. Because the first interesting name of the show that we've had was Aviva. Yeah. And now we have Tangela. And I just want to know how many of these characters were named after the people that the writers knew and how many were named after pets. Exactly, Blue. You drank too fast. Okay. Also, at a weird cool. angle. But seriously, like, how many were named after people the writers knew and how many were named after pets? Because Tangela sounds like something you would name a puppy. Or a cat. Like, it just... Why would you name a puppy Tangela? I don't know. Also, I keep saying it Tangela. Like, Tangelo. Like Angela? The T in front of it? Yeah. Tangella. That's a weird color for Jello. <laughs> it's Tangella. 
Weird. <laughs> what flavor do you think that'd be? Beige. <laughs> it's bacon. <laughs> gravy. Dude, if somebody made Oh my god, that's like gravy jello. with extra cornstarch. It really is. Or like maltodextrin. Or what, I don't know, some gastronomic thing. Agar agar? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I only know what any of it is because sometimes they chopped. use it on chopped. Yeah. 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 Oh, so I love that I finally got an answer to whether or not Ted eats the food. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Because I have looked that up before. Mm hmm. Yeah. The answer being not really, but sometimes. Well, also, like, they all just eat it cold. Yeah. They go, was, they run over to the stations the second they're done. It tastes like the stuff that needs to be hot. Yeah. And then they wait because it's usually like 20 minutes. Yeah. At and least. then they'll come back in and then they'll judge. Yeah. I just thought it was fascinating that, like, it takes like 16 hours to record an episode of that. Yeah, like 12 or 16 hours. Yeah. Anyway, back to this show. But of course, her name is Tangela. Yeah. Because so. they had to think of a weird name. Mm hmm. Because she's quirky. Oh my god! Uh huh. So we cut to outside, and Prue and Phoebe walk across the street and get in Prue's little black convertible and drive off fast, like screeching tires and everything. Mm hmm. And we see that they're, they have been parked over a manhole, which is billowing steam. Mm hmm. And then a light appears out of this manhole and yep. appears a man. Wearing a very long black jacket yes. over a black turtleneck and black pants. So he's a black hole. Uh -huh. He's a manhole. Yep. That was a bit of a stretch. A little bit. I'm cool with it. Okay. And he puts his arms out like a Jesus on the cross pose and, and starts sniffs sniffing the air. Yeah. Oh my god. Like super weird. Like, hey, is someone making popcorn kind of sniff? But his nostrils are fucking ginormous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. And I had flashbacks when I saw that guy. I'm like, oh, yes, you, I like you, you good. Oh, well, man. he's not. No, but no, he's not. Good actor. Yes. And then, so we cut back inside, and Tangela is blowing out the candles, and she looks around nervously before turning off the light, and then Smoke Dude knocks on the door, and she says that they're closed, and, and turns off another light. And he looks like a floating light. head. Uh, well, a little, because he's black on black. And you can't and... see his hands. Yeah. But then he'd be a floating head with floating hands. Yeah. And then he's just kind of, like, dead-faced, knocking. Yeah. She's like, yeah, we're closed. And he knocks again louder. louder. And, and the camera's, repeats. like, in on his face. Yeah. And she's like, fuck you, no, we're closed. But not after walking into a beam of light on her face. Yeah, well, you know. And then he just walks through, through the, the door. door. Like a like, ghost. Yeah. yeah, just phases through it. It kind of, the effect is interesting. It kind of, like, bubbles around him. Uh-huh. And then he's through and she's like, oh my god, which I thought was a weird proclamation yes. from an occult person. Yes. From, Absolutely. from a witch. Like, and, okay. and he, but his, his one was, not to me, witch. And like the way he said it was like, you knew he was trying to call her a bitch. You know, like that's, that's it's like, not me, bitch. You know, like, I don't know. I, I, I saw that more of a. I know he was, yeah. Well, yeah, it, I, get the, I get that the purpose was to be like, oh, he knows you're a witch. Like, yeah. Well, and, be, and make no mistake. Yeah, and and it was to to use the word witch as a bad thing, like like okay, witch yeah. is an insult. Was like how I took it. Wait, witch is an insult. Yes. No, wit witch is an insult. Yes. Witch. Yes. But which one? Yes. But which one is an insult? I don't know. Third base. <laughs> All right. So Tangella picks up what is apparently an amulet. Some kind of it was amber a, looking orb. It was like a bright red fucking crystal. Oh, okay. It was dark. I couldn't really see what it was. Yeah. Well, they show it later. Oh, true. And it falls to the ground. But yeah, it was a bright red fucking crystal. Yeah. Well, like a crystal ball. No, like... like it was a ball. No. I'm pretty sure it was a ball. It was like a diamond shape when it fell to the ground. Maybe there's a diamond shape in it? No. Well, look it up real quick. I could have sworn it was a ball. Well, but when it falls, it looked like a crystal shape. Like the stereotypical diamond, where it's flat on the top and conical at the bottom. Okay, so what you mean about the bright red? Mm-hmm. And that pink skirt, man. Mm-hmm. Oh, in her hand? Yep. Okay, so it must have been the way she was holding it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, so she picks up the amulet to try to protect herself, but he says that amulets don't work with this demon. And he passes his hand in front of his face, casting the shadow of his hand over her face. I liked that effect. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. Because, like, you know, clearly the light wasn't at the right place for his hand to make a shadow over her face. But it's just a nice effect to show you, like, something's going on. Yeah. He's he's doing something actively to her, and it's dark. Yeah. Because shadows. 
And he says that her greatest fear is being buried alive in an earthquake. Because, of course, she lives in San Francisco. That's yeah. got to be a fear. Yeah. But, you know, if, if your greatest fear is to be buried alive in an earthquake, I don't know. If that was my fear, I would move out of California. Most likely. Where there are earthquakes. If he surfaces once every 1,300 years, how does he pick his location? Yeah. Who knows? Th um, this is why I, I might it's... say he picks his location a la convenience. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely a la convenience. A la convenience. The 1300 year on a Friday the 13th, which would not occur every 1300 years, but fuck it, we'll go with it anyway. And he picks the place where the sisters are. Just otherwise we wouldn't see it and then this would not have been an episode. But they're like, fuck it, we'll make it an episode. It's kind of like Buffy. Mm-hmm. Where in, you know, the bad guys can go just about anywhere and they show up in Sunnydale. Well, they have a, a mechanic to Well, explain yeah, they that. have the hell mouth. There's, but, no, you know. there's no mechanic explaining that in Charmed, necessarily. Like, yeah, well. in a couple of episodes, there is a mechanic explaining some things, but not everything. I don't know. For those of you in the know, that is, is there a woogie in the house? Oh, yeah, we'll get there. Woogie. Fucking woogie, man. Anyway. Woogie. Makes me want to... Get down and woogie. <laughs> Not today, my dear. Not today. No. That's still a couple of weeks away. Anyway. So the room starts shaking and things fall off the shelves. And she, like, raises her arms above her head and, and screams. screams. And the shelves fall down around her and the lights go crazy. But nothing is hitting her. No, nothing at all. And then at some point she, like... Tries to move. And he's like... You no, can not run. You're, you're frozen, frozen in fear. fear. He's so theatrical. I love it. Yeah. Like this is this is like, a fun kind of theatrical. I have in my notes the way he says it is super creepy, and he seems to be enjoying her fear. Of course he is. Well, that's kind of the point of him. Uh huh. Yeah. But like, also, he doesn't appear to be looking directly at her. Like he's just looking outside. Like, oh my god, yeah. Yeah. He keeps doing this like arms up in the air, like you know, Christ pose kind of thing. Why MCA? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you know the picture I'm talking about, too. Uh -huh. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> Editing down that laughter is going to be interesting. <laughs> oh. for, for those of you wondering, we laughed for about three minutes. I don't know. It was like <laughs> 30 seconds. You're as bad at judging time as this show is. I know, right? It was like, what? Because first of all, it wasn't five minutes from when they were looking at this shit to her saying, get the fuck out. Yeah, no. No, not it at never all. is. Not at all. One day, More? they will actually guess the amount of time something is going to take, and it will be that amount of time. One day. Actually, probably not. No. But, you know, I don't remember. So I'm not excluding it from happening. Yeah. Or from having happened. Yeah. And us rediscovering it. Yes. Anyway, so Tangela stops screaming and falls to the floor, and we get a quick pan of the room. After which we land on Tangela. We, like, kind of pan down across a rug and yeah. a bunch of debris. And there's Tangela wearing a <laughs> white wig. Uh-huh. Pure white wig. Clearly synthetic. And and you can see that it has the little braids the in little it. Braids and, and the little and braids and the clasps. Yep. Um, but they did not bother to cover her sideburns. Mm-hmm. And it's a clearly synthetic wig. Yep. Yep. And it's way too smooth. Like, her hair is naturally frizzy. A little bit curly. Yeah. And it's completely straight. Yeah, it was bad. It yes. Was, it was super, super bad. Oh, bad. Super, super bad. But it's supposed to show that her hair went white with fright. <laughs> and I love my notes. It was like, I told you she was a goner. Yep. And Smoke Dude walks over to the mailing list and passes his hand above it. And, and uh, half the names disappear. Yeah, there was a name on that list that for a second I thought was my cousin's name. <laughs> but instead of Kate, it was Kyle. Oh, all right. But the, the last name was the important thing. And mm. I'm just like, hang on, what? What? Oh, and then I it, I went back and I'm like, oh no, it says Kyle, it's not Kate, because that would be weird because she was like three the time this episode <laughs> aired, and I don't know how she would have gotten on an occult mailing list. Hey, you know, who knows? Yes, but anyway, all the all the witches' names disappear yep. into his hand, presumably. Yeah, you know, leaving behind the non witches, so we know that not everyone on the list was a witch. So it was obviously something to do with the mailing list that let Tangela know who was magically endowed. Yeah. And so half the names disappear, including Prue and Phoebe's, because for some uh, reason she wrote half, them. More than half, I think. It was a lot. No, I Oh, counted. you counted? Oh, most of the ones that stayed must have been up at the top, because the bottom of the list was pretty empty. Yeah, I counted. It was, of it course was you did. nigh identical to, to half. Maybe off by one. But I thought it was very interesting that Phoebe wrote down both of their names Maybe on two separate lines. that's why wanted them to hurry. 
Yeah, like, why did she write them on two separate lines? She literally could have just written down... Crew and Phoebe. Halliwell and their address. Yeah. Like, it wasn't like you were going to get 20% off if you wrote them both down. Oh, if only. Yeah, but whatever. That's just, you know, my crazy, I guess. And then we get one last shot of Tangela on the ground where we see that the amulet was a large red crystal and you get a very clear shot of her red sideburns before we go to the opening credits. And so after the opening credits, we get a quick bridge shot before heading to the manor. Piper walks down the stairs holding a small box, and we get a very interesting camera angle through oh, the right. door. Oh, what, what was the song on the DVD? Well, here's the thing. I actually wrote in my notes so I wouldn't forget, is I have no idea what the song is that was playing, since neither Soundhound or Shazam had a clue. But the lyrics were very much about Friday the 13th and Superstition. Oh, okay. So it was a very, like... Maybe it was written for the show okay. type thing. What was it on Netflix? I don't. Didn't I text you about it? I forget. I don't think so. Not this one. This one, I I don't think I could find because there wasn't really anything identifiable. The lyrics were kind of generic. Interesting. Um, Looking it up on Netflix, that is most definitely not the song that was on the DVD. Oh, I think I found it. Yeah, I found it. Okay. Ain't Life Sweet by Jamie Gerard. Hmm. Yeah. Do you have an opinion, Blue? <laughs> anyway, I looked up on IMDb for what these songs could be. And mm-hmm. the only three songs, and all of the songs are uncredited. They always are. The only three songs on IMDb for this episode is No Mercy by Khalil, Throw Me by Chasing Furies, and The Answer by Brooke Remmel. Did you look all those up? I did not, because... Okay, then that is what we will do. No idea what the song is. We tried looking up the three songs that IMDb says it was, and none of those songs sounded familiar. Not at all. Even remotely. Mm Mm-hmm. But, yeah. But the song on the Netflix was definitely Ain't Life Sweet by Jamie Gerard. Yes. Which she apparently has a demo version that's a little more synthy. Hmm. Or actually, that might not be the demo version. The guitar might be the demo version. Don't know. It didn't say. Yeah, don't know. Or maybe she just decided to do an electric and an acoustic version. I don't know. Either way, it's cool. Yeah. It's nice. It actually fits. It's not too bad. It, it doesn't well, the fit lyrics as well. Don't fit. The lyrics yeah. don't fit, but the the overall tone is yeah. fine. I'm yeah. okay with it. Yeah. I didn't look up when it was published, but right now I don't care. I'm sure it was after 2000. Yeah, probably. But yeah, the original song had like lyrics about Friday the 13th and superstitions and stuff. And Piper is wearing a white shirt and black pants that look like the exact same clothes that she was wearing in the Wendigo episode. It's her uniform. Yeah. She likes to stick with her uniform. Yeah. Wouldn't you? Uniform? No. No. I would not a form. <laughs> so, in the solarium... Piper is shuffling through her box of yep, good luck charms. The box and picks out a, a few necklaces. Out. Mostly crosses? They, like yeah, the first one, all of The them. first one is like a... Well, the third one has a cross on, but it's not technically a cross. Well, they all have a similar theme of the cross. Yes. And then some random ass sage in a bundle. She, they were, yeah, there were two smudge sticks. Mm-hmm. But, so I took pictures of yeah. each of the amulets. They're all a bit crap because resolution and such, but, you know, it's not like they were sitting on a table. She was holding them in the air and they were swinging. So I got yes. the best, least blurry shots that I could. They're up on the website. Yes, the first yeah. one is, like, a, a sort of silvery cross with some crystals sticking out from the... With a red stone in the middle. Yeah, yeah it was, like, four crystals mm-hmm. jutting out. Yeah. Uh, and it was the shape of a cross, definitely. The, the next one was with the copper dude. Or am I thinking of something else? Because there were, weren't there three there crosses only, and a, or were there three necklaces? There were necklaces only three stuff? necklaces. Okay, so then the second one The was, second one was the green stone. Yes, green stone and kind of coppery metal. I don't know. It was, it looked tarnished, so I don't know what it could have been. But it looked like, it was surrounded by four, it looked like fleur de lis, kind of. But well, like, it looked like it was only to the be. top half yeah. of fleur de lis, so it kind of looked like birds. Yeah. And the third one is a pendant with a cross that looks like it's being held by a hand. And, and there's some, some like birds lines. and stuff around it and whatever. And then we quick cut, time lapse, time jump to Piper and Phoebe walking out of the kitchen in the solarium. And Piper is wearing that last necklace. So that's the one she decided to go with. Mm-hmm. And Phoebe's saying something about, no, haven't you ever noticed she's never said it to us? Talking yeah. about Prue. And the entire thing is adr and Phoebe is in a gray dress suit that has a very mini skirt. Yes. And apparently no top underneath the jacket. Yeah. And she's wearing one of those nice little plastic choker things. Mm-hmm. That were all the rage. And a headband. Yeah. A nice chunky headband. Yeah. Like silk colored or something. Yeah. It was, like, it was cute. 
Yeah, so they're walking out of the kitchen and they're in ADR for some reason. And talking, talking about, about how Prue never, never says, says I love you. Yeah. But instead says things like, me too, and same here. Prue walks in wearing a pink turtleneck top with the neck turned down and black pants. And they say good morning to each other and they sit down at the table. And it looks like a cafe table. Like, it's the wrought mm-hmm. iron yeah, looking it's thing. Cute. It's super adorable. And uh, Prue says that, you know, Phoebe looks really great in that outfit. And Phoebe's like, oh, well, thanks for giving to me. And Piper's like, wait, you, you gave her that? Yeah. And oh, it's like, like an early birthday present. present. For, for the, the next, next three years. years. Yeah. And Piper Piper reaches down to Prue's forehead and she's like, are you okay? <laughs> are you feeling okay? Now, when they sit down, Phoebe crosses her legs. And as she sits, we, we can see that Alyssa does indeed have a tattoo around her leg near the foot. Like I thought she did. In the last episode when she was wearing tights. Because you notice way more about this than I do. I do. You watch the episode and take notes as you go. I watch yeah. the episode and pause to take my notes. So I don't miss things. Yeah. As much as possible. Well, also, like, it's not a matter of, like, if I notice it and I want to write it down, mm-hmm. I'll write it down. I generally don't forget what I've seen. It's just, like, if I don't see it, yeah. it doesn't happen. Like, yeah. the rivets on the clock I saw but didn't think were noteworthy. And I just thought it was an interesting because it was cutting the the numbers. Yeah. Like, it was just weird. But yeah, so Piper does the touch of Prue's forehead and asks if she's feeling okay, which was super cute. And Prue says that she's fine and that she had a wonderful dream about mom. And Piper asks what it was about. And Prue says that she was a little kid reaching up, holding her hand, and she was taking her someplace that she didn't know where it was, but, but it felt, it felt really, really safe. safe. Yeah. And Phoebe says that she wishes that she had dreams like that. To which Piper replies, Mom would have to knock before walking into your dreams. Uh Uh-huh. Which gets a really cute little face scrunch and an ooh Ooh, from Phoebe. Just with one finger. Yeah. It was super cute. It was adorable. And then Prue yawns, which of course made me yawn. And and as Prue is yawning, (laughs) Piper just reaches her hand over again and covers Prue's mouth. And Prue's like, dude, what the fuck? Yeah, she yanks her hands away. Like, what are you doing? Well, if you yawn, Prue, you'll let the devil in. You have to cover your mouth. Which is something I haven't heard since elementary school. Yeah, well. And of course, you know, her sisters laugh at her. Yeah. As you do. And she elaborates, of, especially on Friday the 13th. Like, Piper is about as much into the whole Friday the 13th shit as Tangella was. Yeah. But, you know. But she's clearly not quirky because she doesn't have braids. Yep. And Prue asks if the amulet that she's wearing is one of the things that they picked up for her the night before, and she says that it is. She goes, and these two, as she holds up the smudge sticks and the other necklaces. Because apparently, there is a superstition-themed fundraiser at Quake, so she's going to need all the help she can get. Because of course there is. Uh-huh. And Prue asks... If- this is the first event we've heard of at Quake, isn't it? Yes. Well, but- no. No. This is the second, because there was the convention... Well, there was a convention in town. We don't think it... It wouldn't have been at Quake. True. Because a convention involves, like, meetings and yeah, business true. people, and if you're us, cosplayers. Yes. Which, it wasn't that kind of a convention from what we could see of the people with the name tags. Yes. Very true. But, yeah. Yeah. But so Prue asks if she may be overdoing it just a little bit. Just a little bit. Uh-huh. But Piper says with all the warlocks and demons they've seen, she doesn't think so. And Prue's like, yeah, but those are real. Yeah. (laughs) And superstitions are like old wives' tales invented to explain somebody's misfortune. (laughs) And they ask Phoebe to chime in, and she goes, you know what? I like superstitions as long as they're the good luck variety. Yep. But before that happens, Piper says that statistics showed more bad things happen on Friday the 13th than any other day, and that apparently she met Jeremy on Friday the 13th. So, so we know when Grams was in the hospital. Right, but but Phoebe apparently didn't know that, and then, of course, she goes, and he tried to kill me. But, okay, so that means that there's Friday the 13th twice in a year? Or two years in a row? Two years in a row, it would seem. Because she'd only known Jeremy for six, six months. months. So two years in a row. Well, no, because... So apparently we live in an alternate universe where there's always a Friday the 13th around the same time of the year. Yeah, I, yeah. Because it's been about six months since that. Yeah. Uh, it, four. No, yeah, it's less than six months. But, like, that's what I'm saying. It's like, there's Friday the 13th twice in a year? Like, I don't... Well, it wouldn't have been twice in a year. Well, yeah, you're right. It would have been a, a one unless, every of course, year because we, we were in September. Unless, of course, September. we had a, had a leap year where there was a Friday the 13th. 
Well, I don't, it wasn't a week. But on February, and then there would have been one in March. Sometimes there are two in a year, though. Yes, but it's it's not you know six months apart like that. Well, it wouldn't have been six uh, months apart. It would have yeah, been ten months apart. Whatever, math not my strong suit. But yeah, whatever. She goes on to say that you know there's a superstition that any relationship started on Friday the thirteenth is doomed. And Prue rightfully says that more bad things happen on Friday the 13th because people put energy into believing bad things will happen on Friday the 13th. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Absolutely. And that's when Piper looks to Phoebe to be like, Phoebes, you want to chime in? And, and that's when she's like, like I, I, I got my fucking good luck charm. I want to go to my interview. Hey, Pipes, can you drive? Yeah. But I do think it's adorable. She calls her little good luck charm. She goes, this little honey. Which was just hilarious to me. I don't know why. It struck me funny. It's super cute. And so she asked Piper for a lift because she's running late. Piper's and, like, cool. Yeah, sure. Yep. And she starts heading toward the doorway, and Phoebe calls back to Prue to have a good day. And she says, I love you. And Prue responds with, yeah, me too. Which makes both Piper and Phoebe stop, look back at, e- at her, and then back at each other, and then they continue walking. Cut to the other room. And Piper wonders if Prue realizes that she does that. And they start heading for the door, and they open the door, and Andy's there, standing with his fist up like he was just about to knock. He's in a brown suit today, with a reddish tie. Have you listened to the Dear John and Hank episode 59, where John says that that red, orange, and yellow are all shades of brown? Yes. It's an interesting one. Yes. It's very, very interesting. And they say their hellos, and he asks if Prue's home, and Phoebe calls out, Prue, there's a policeman here to see you! (laughs) Which I just thought was funny. And then she runs out the door, and Piper says goodbye, that they're running late, and she leaves. And he closes the door behind him and walks into the living room, and Prue meets him, saying that it must be bad news because it's a little early for a social call, which was also kind of funny. And Annie says that she's right, and then we have a little bit of exposition time, where he tells her that they've had three suspicious deaths since midnight, all single females, all under the age of 30, and that one was a bookstore owner, and the credit card records show that Prue was her last customer. Aw. So sad. Yeah. So, he asks if she remembers anything out of the ordinary or anyone suspicious hanging around, but she says that Phoebe and she were the only ones there, and the owner was locking up when they left, and Andy asks if the place was in order, and when Prue says that it was, he says that when they found her, her body was half buried in debris. And apparently the coroner said that it wasn't her injuries that killed her, but instead it was a heart attack. Now, I know on IMDb, I don't know if it's still there because I refuted it, but on IMDb there was a goof in there saying that, you know, when we saw her body it wasn't covered at all in debris. And it's like, but we only saw the top half of her. Yeah. And he said that she was half covered in debris, so it could have been the bottom half. You don't know. So I refuted that IMDb claim. As you should. Absolutely. Absolutely. As well you should. No. Absolutely. But so Prue questions the heart attack claim, and Annie continues saying that her hair had turned shock white and her face was contorted in terror, just like all the others. Even though when we saw her face, it didn't look contorted at all. Not really. Nope. But I don't know if Andy's the best at reading facial expressions. But it didn't even. She didn't even look scared when we saw her. Like it well, looked like I, her mouth wasn't that's even what I'm open. Saying. Like that's what I'm saying. I think Andy has a has a problem reading facial expressions because mm. twice in this episode he misjudges them. Well, you know. But he says that it looked like she was literally scared to death, and then asks if she visits occult bookstores at midnight often. Which she comes back with, no, mm, of course no. not. That Phoebe needed a good luck charm for her job interview, so it was very last minute. And Andy then says the killings looked like some weird ritualistic thing, that the victims all had ties to the occult, and that she might consider shopping somewhere else. And Prue gets that, like, don't tell me what to do look on her face, and asks what he means. And he just says, you know, be careful, and then he gets up to leave. And then we time shift again. We cut to the attic, and Prue has opened the Book of Shadows. She turns... One page, we see something... The title page. We see the, we see the title page, we see another page, and then she grabs a chunk, flips, and suddenly we're to something about Friday the 13th. Yeah. Well, but here's the funny thing, right? So she opens the book. Because I guess, she I opens... guess they're like, this is going to seem unrealistic. She just opens the book to the right page. Let's have her futz around for like a couple of pages. Except... She doesn't futz around for a couple of pages. Yeah. She cuts... She, uh, a she page. opens the cover... And so we see the title page. She flips a single page, and we see the entry for Javna. Yeah. And then she grabs, like, an entire chunk, 
to nearly the back of the book and pulls it over and we see two co- two paragraphs of handwriting. But I thought it was very funny, though, the picture... There's a continuity error, then. Because then, in the shot where it's just her on her reading the book, the chunk she's flipped is smaller than the chunk left in the book. So she couldn't have flipped the entire... Like, through most of the book, because it yeah, was it less was, than half. Yeah, because she grabbed, like, a shit ton of pages. Well, granted, it is a book of shadows. There really are a shit ton of pages. Yes. But... What I thought was interesting was the page for Javna, the, the picture shown in the sketch looked nothing like what Javna actually looked like. Yep. Like, the picture in the sketch had, like, horns and wings, and Javna looked like a creepy old man. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But whatever. So we see the, the two paragraphs of writing on the page that she flips to. It's lovely handwriting, and it's supposedly their mother's. Yeah, it's a little too regular, I think. Yeah. It, it looks like if you have, like... It looks like Alex's handwriting. The calligraphy dude on Snapchat. Oh yes, yeah, it does. It does kind of look like a little bit like calligraphy. But so she reads from the book that the demon of fear appears once every thirteen hundred years on Friday the thirteenth. He feeds on the fears of the witches for his survival. And I took a shot of the page, but the resolution is a bit crap. And I know we're going to get this info a little later in the episode, but since they're showing us the page, I might as well give you the exposition, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so. I was able to gather from the page that the fear demon's name is Barbus. Which they never use in the episode. They never use in the episode. And if he can kill 13 unmarried female witches before midnight on Friday the 13th, he will break free from his eternal bonds and walk the earth for eternity. And the last paragraph says, A witch's only defense is to identify and then release her greatest fear. Do not rely on your Wicca powers for defense, for in the face of your greatest fear, these powers are paralyzed. And the word Wicca was not capitalized, which I also thought was a little interesting. And then we cut to Quake. And outside Quake, Tan Jacket Floral Skirt Lady is there with another woman, and we see the valet dude going to a car. You wonder if they're dating? Yeah, I don't know. They're constantly going to Quake together. Yeah. And leaving Quake. Yeah. Who knows? They're always together. Okay, that's it. They're dating. Head cannon accepted. And then we go inside and we see Piper talking to a woman in a gray dress holding a roll of tickets. Is that, was that Shelly? No. No, it, I, it looked like it might have been, but I wasn't paying too close of attention. I don't think it was. I just know it was a blonde with a hair and a ponytail. Like, that's all I remember. Yeah. I don't know, but Prue then comes up behind her, so we have jumped time yet again. Well, she tells, she tells the girl that they need... A table for taking tickets, because apparently there's a raffle happening at this fundraiser. And then, like, starts looking down at her clipboard, at which point Prue walks up behind her. And, and we get a quick shot of a blonde man wearing a red top and dark brown pants. Isn't it a and turtleneck? He, yeah. And it looks like he could be a model. And Piper is death staring. Yes. But we also see a waitress walk by in a very skimpy outfit that looks like a cross between a Halloween costume of a cat and an ice skating dress. Yeah. It was super, super tiny. Yeah. But I digress. And then, of course, Prue sees where Pipes is looking. Mm-hmm. And startles Piper by, by asking, asking her who about he is. It. Yeah. And she says his name is Lucas Devane, and he's chairing the fundraiser for the children's hospital. Now, why are you having a fundraiser for a children's hospital where the theme is superstition? That is just... It's silly. It's just weird. Also, it's not October. Black cats, Halloween... I can see well, some but it was, superstition it was, stuff happening. But it was black cats because of superstition. I know. To not have a black cat cross I know, but that would fit in better for Halloween. Yeah. Like, if it was around Halloween, I could see that happening more for Children's Hospital. But in the middle of fucking, fucking February? Yeah, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Also, I'm calling him Mr. Vane now. It's Devane. Miss Dervane, yes. Yeah. Anyway, I'll just call him Lucas, because that's his name. And he's not creepy, and he doesn't die, even though they've given him a name. But well, they give him a last name. Yeah, true. That's the important part. True. Well, but Martin doesn't have a last name, and he has yet to die. Martin. Piper's boss. Oh. Did they not give him a last name? Well, they mm-hmm. didn't give Doug or Shelley a last name. True. They gave them character arcs. True. And we actually see Doug again I know. later in this episode. I thought it was super cute. We'll I mentioned get... it last week because I was yeah. super excited to see him. Yeah, we'll get there. But yeah, Prue says that she saw his picture in a magazine, and he was named one of... The Bay Area's most eligible bachelors. And Piper's like, don't rub it in. (laughs) Which I thought was funny. And Prue says she's the one who's letting a silly superstition run her life. 
And then Piper asks if he's still looking in her direction, and Prue says that he is, and that he's undressing her with his mind. And he's down to white cotton. Yeah. And Piper, Piper. for some reason, in a, what sounds a bit like a southern accent, she's like, I haven't worn white, white cotton, cotton since, since high, high school. school. Yeah. And I'm like, why life. not? It's comfy. Is it because periods? And here we are, again, talking, talking about, about periods. periods. Oh, my God. We haven't I spoken of boots. No, I Wait. guess we haven't. No. We'll get there. Yeah. At some point. Yeah. Yeah, we will. At the end, we'll get to boobs. I'm trying to think or of when bras. we've gotten to boobs. Or at least bras. Probably get to bras, that's for sure. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, oh, this... no, I know where you're talking about. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, they start walking. They have that cute sister moment. They approach a ladder, and Piper stops them from going under it. And as they, they walk like, around it, she aren't goes, their arms linked? humor me, which I thought was funny. Yeah. Yeah, their, their arms are linked. It's super cute. Yeah. And, and then... P- Piper, like... Seriously, like Prue's a horse, she's like, whoa! Yeah, just humor me as they walk around it, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh-huh. And then she apologizes for having to rush off the phone. So apparently there was a phone call that we didn't get to see. Now, I like this bit of writing because it shows that things happen and we don't have to see every bit of it. So it makes things go faster. It gives us a bit of an idea that there are things that are happening off screen that we're not privy to. Uh-huh. And I like it. I, I enjoy that because then, you know... Some continuity errors, not mm-hmm. all of them, but some of them where it's the, we cut from one room to another and they're either holding something that they weren't holding before. Or Piper's or, hair is now up, whereas before it was down. Yeah. Little things where I can go, okay, well, if there's a time shift where they were doing one thing in one room and then a while later they're in another room, then I can forgive. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like walking from the kitchen to the dining room with a cup of of milk where the yeah. amount of milk changes that i cannot forgive nope. just saying anyway so piper asks about the demon of fear and prue says that she found a page about him in the book of shadows in mom's handwriting and piper asks if she's sure about the handwriting and prue says that she checked the handwriting against the back of the spirit board well also she recognized it on the page which i thought was pretty impressive well i would recognize my mother's handwriting Yes, but after she'd been dead for 20 years? Maybe. I mean, I know I'd recognize the way. Yeah, because I, I recognize my grandmother's handwriting. Okay, yeah. And she's cool. been gone for quite a while. Okay. So, yeah. I still think it's impressive. Hmm. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on if you saw that person writing a lot mm-hmm. while they were alive, whether you'd recognize their handwriting. Because I'd, like, I'd recognize my grandfather's writing if he was like, like if I saw like his name written down or something like that, like I'd be like, oh, yeah, he had, he had to have written that. But, like, you know, if it's just a random sentence, I, I might not. But, like, my grandma used to write all the time, so she was a teacher. Mm-hmm. She was writing all the time, so I recognize her handwriting. But, I don't know. But So they go sit down at the bar, and Piper says it's the first time that they've found anything with mom's handwriting, or anything that their mom has written in the book. Now, I have a question. Didn't she go through the entire Book of Shadows before? Like, wouldn't she have seen this page? Well, I can think, I can think of a way that might be explained. Based on later in the episode. Yes. I will admit, yes. But also, I know when I'm trying to skim for information... Information? Skin for information. That's a weird phrase. Okay, when I'm trying to skim for information, Mm -hmm. I don't always read all of the stuff, and I don't always recognize handwriting, or like a style or anything. Because usually, if I'm skimming for, you know, keywords... I will literally just have on the pattern recognition for keywords, mm-hmm. not overall theme or something. If I I'm guess, skimming, but... if I'm skimming for a particular image that I know I saw, I would be skipping over blocks of text. I guess so. so. If she's looking but, like before when she was looking for I forget what, but like looking but through the she entire was just book, reading the book. Like she no, was that just was going Phoebe. Through both of them have Phoebe and Piper. Oh yeah. They were both going through well, the book. Well, Piper was younger than Prue. Like, it's impressive for Prue. It would be astronomical for Piper. Because she's, like, 25. So she was she was little. Well, no, it would be astronomical for Phoebe. Phoebe couldn't read. Yeah. Like, it would be it would be amazing for Phoebe to have Piper remembered Piper was Mom's probably just learning to but, read. But here's the thing. They all know what Mom's handwriting looks like from the back of the spirit board. They all know... They, True, but that's, a, that's an etching. Well, but, you know... It's a little different. Only a little. Mm, a little. Only a little. More than a little. Only a little. Well, no, because, like, depending on what you use to etch. Well, if you're good at etching. If you do, like, a, a, a China marker test phase, test run, maybe. 
if you've like planned it out with your actual handwriting, then you can cover over that. But if you're just doing it with like a scratchy scratch all or something like that, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the tools are for etching. <laughs> it's usually an etching tool. Gee, that's handy. Yeah. Anyway, so Piper questions the or the or she's you know surprised about seeing mom's writing something in the book and Pri says that their mom must have known that this demon would appear in their lifetime and she wanted to warn them against him. And of course Piper rightfully doesn't like the sound of that. Nope. And then Prue tells her about the killing 13 unmarried which is before midnight bit and Piper like, goes back with like single people don't have enough problems. <laughs> yeah, it was very funny. Which okay, it's just it's like, super annoying. It's like, "Oh, they've got to be married." Yeah, cause... unmarried. Well, no, I mean, like, to be safe, you have to be oh, yeah. married. Like, it, mm. yeah, I know. Well, I think the connotation there is that if you're unmarried, you're a virgin. And if you're married, you're not. I think that was possibly the connotation Well, there. in that case, all the sisters should be safe. I know, right? They should be perfectly fine. Don't know about Tangella, but Zoe probably is. Like, come on, people. 20th century. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> 20th century. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Late 20th century. Practically the 21st. But not yet. Not yet. Not yet. But it's basically margin of error. Within the margin of error, it's less than a year. Hmm. So let's call it 21st century. Yeah. Modern. It's certainly in the modern, modern era. Century. Yeah, modern era. Or is it in the postmodern era? No, that'd be, no. Not. That'd be meme culture. Unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But yeah. No, so, fortunately. Well. I fucking love meme culture. You kidding me? So Piper asks how they can stop him, and Prue says that she doesn't know, and then it mentions how he turns a witch's greatest fear against them, and the bit about their powers being paralyzed in the moment, and that's when Piper has another funny line of, we're on the most wanted list and we're defenseless? Fuck this shit. And then she asks if Mom said anything about how to get rid of him, and Prue said that, you know, all she wrote was to release their fear. What the fuck does that mean? Yeah. Don't know. Piper has no idea. And Piper says that Piper is afraid of flying, but Piper says that it's not really a fear. She just prefers buses. No, like you're that. afraid of flying. Sorry. Yeah, I thought that was funny. I was like, that is what someone who is afraid of something says. Yes. No, it's not really a fear. I just, no. You're afraid you're of flying. Afraid of it. It's fine. It's fine. You have As someone left who is afraid California. of flying, I totally get it. Mm-hmm. I hate flying. I hate it so much. The other people on the plane usually annoy me more than the flight. My problem is that I'm a control freak. Mm-hmm. I am aware that I'm a control freak. So being in a plane where I have absolutely no control over anything terrifies me. Even if I'm in a pa- like if I'm a passenger in a car, I have at least a little bit of control mm-hmm. in that if I see something you coming, I can say driver. something. Yeah. You see something. You, you say, say something, something and, and you drink, do drink not you do not drink to forget. <laughs> yes. But so Prue says that as long as she stays in the crowded restaurant, that she'll be fine. And since Phoebe's afraid of being trapped in an elevator, she'll tell her to take the stairs. Which, again, I was like, yep, I could see being trapped in an elevator being a fear. Mm -hmm. I'm claustrophobic, so I get that one, too. Yep. I wonder what my greatest fear would be, though. Yeah, I was thinking about that, too, and I couldn't come up with much. Well, the problem is I can come up with many a fear that I have. Yeah. But I don't know which one would be the one that, like, would kill me by being so fearful about it. I think mine might involve dismemberment. Well, then. Just based on, like, shit I can't watch in movies. Yeah, well. Yeah. Or, or it's, it might be involving him. Probably. You cutie. Yeah. Oh, you're cute. Oh, he's so muffled. Cutie. <laughs> Let, me kiss. Let him sleep. Anyway, so Piper tells... Prue to stay away from pools because ever since mom drowned, she's been terrified of the water. Which apparently Prue never told anyone, but they're just like, dude, we knew. Yeah, it's well, fine. you know, you never took swimming lessons with us, so we got it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Like, like we right. get it. Mom drowned. Yeah. We're understanding. Like, yeah. it's it's not surprising to us, especially mm-hmm. considering your behavior. Like, yeah, absolutely. Don't be stressed about the fact that we know. We've always known. And so Prue tells Piper not to worry about her, and she starts to leave. And then Piper tells Prue to call her when she gets to Buckland's, but apparently Prue isn't going to Buckland's. She says that their mom warned them, but there are others. Mm -hmm. And Piper says, we don't know any other witches. And in my notes, uh, like, the first thing I was like, I was like, what about Aviva? Oh, right, her powers came from a demon. Forgot there for a moment. Yep. (laughs) 
Like, mm. but, all right. But Prue mentions how, like, the flyer that Tangela handed her mm-hmm. had a contact at the bottom, so she's going to go find this woman and talk to her. Named Zoe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we know she's doomed, because she's gotten a name. Yep. Even though we haven't met her yet. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And then Prue walks out underneath the ladder. Yep. And Piper As calls Piper out says, and I love you. And, and she just replies, yep. And, like, waves her hand or something. Yep. yep. And walks Hilarious. underneath the ladder. Uh, and then we cut to SWA properties. And we get an exterior shot. And a woman in a suit in shades of blue walks past the sign. And I bring this up for a reason that will come back later. See, I definitely watch for people walking past that. They do use more than one shot of people walking past SWA properties. They they have two. But and they, they use repeat it three one. times. They repeat the first yes. one twice. But yeah, so we get the woman in shades of blue walking past the sign, and we cut inside. Th- what do you think SWA property stands for? Some watery assholes? <laughs> <laughs> oh my. <laughs> some witches, actually. <laughs> some wicked apartments. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Except they're in 10, friend. Not Boston. Yeah. But who knows where it started, you yeah. know? I love it when... You can make up an acronym and it'll sound official, but the actual meaning of the acronym is super funny. Yeah. Or just, like, super informal. That makes it funny. Yeah. (laughs) So we cut inside, and a woman in a very purple suit jacket is telling Phoebe, who has added a black jacket with a fuzzy color to her outfit, that while they're a small firm, they're very successful. And Phoebe says that size doesn't matter to her. But that she's excited because if she wants to be a success, then who better to learn from than a successful woman? Which, okay, normally is a line. A bit cliche, like, planned. But Phoebe just delivers it so well. Mm Mm-hmm. So casually. Yeah. And it works. It does. The woman hires her on the fucking spot. My favorite, though, is we get a little insert shot of her rubbing the coin. Yeah. And it's funny to me because she had her hand in the air one split second and the next split second she's rubbing the coin with both hands. And we get to see her legs. Because, you know. Legs. Legs in the very short skirt. Yeah. But, yeah. So, yeah, the woman seems pleased with the response and asks when she can start. To which, you know, Phoebe is rightfully surprised. Like, I got the job? Yeah. She's... Granted, she's gotten a few jobs by this point, but for some reason, every job she gets on the show, she's always really surprised that she actually got it. Yeah. Like, even with the psychic. Yeah. Although she was super prepped for that one. Yeah. She had the outfit ready. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, then, you know, trying to work for Prue, she had to kind of pressure her into it. She got roped into helping Piper. Mm Mm-hmm. And other than that, I, I can't really think of any jobs she's actually had. Like, yeah, other I think, than working at Quake. But she didn't really work at Quake. She, she was just helping out. She was just helping out. I assume she got paid. Well, but that doesn't mean... A meager sum, but still. Yeah. That's that's like, you know, we, we hired a contractor. Like, was, five bucks an hour. Yeah. But whatever. So the woman says that she can spot talent when she sees it, and then asks if Phoebe can start today. That woman's bangs bother me. Her entire hairstyle bothered me, but... But, like, they kind of... They're just... Mm, the way they curl in on themselves, like, it's weird. It was deliberate, I'm sure. I know it was deliberate. Yeah. Like, I just finished watching Heathers yesterday. Well, there you I go. have seen some fucked up bangs. <sighs> yeah. And I'm not talking about the bomb. <laughs> anyway. Or the gunshots. Yeah. But so, Phoebe excitedly says that she can indeed start that day, and a guy walks in wearing a black leather jacket, white polo shirt, and black pants. And, like, his hair looked like stereotypical surfer dude. Mm, Very California. Yeah, very, very California. They kind of match. Yeah. They could almost be related. Mm. Which would make it very Game of Thrones, because she says, Honey, wait outside. Yeah. Hi, honey. Yeah. He walks back out, and she gives Phoebe the keys, says that Luis is out of town, and she'll be in Calistoga for the day. We see other people in this office, but, you know, for some reason, Phoebe, who has not been through background check, Mm-hmm. Who has not given out her W two info mm-hmm. or anything? Right, but all is she has hired to do is answer the phone and is given the keys. Yeah, but all she has to do is answer the phone. Yes, but she's given so. the keys. Yeah, well, which you know. will not just have the door key; it will also have keys to all of oh, the I houses. I don't know a safe. Yeah, probably. Well, they probably it would have a key to a drawer with keys to houses. I would assume, probably, or at least a file 
for the numbers of the lockboxes that they keep at these houses. Yeah. So, yeah, this is super unconventional hiring practices, and it kind of bothers me. Well, but I think it comes down to... They need to quickly have Phoebe with a job and doing shit. And they need to quickly have Phoebe there so that this woman can take a break. As Phoebe says, a romantic midweek break. Yeah. Yeah. And then the woman is like, Ugh. oh, and I need you to do a favor for me. A from special time, task. From time to time. Yeah. If my husband calls, I need you to cover for me. And Phoebe is just dumbstruck. Yeah, she gets wide she, eyes. She, she starts looks laughing over. Nervously. She looks over at the blonde dude. She does this awkward, like startled, like huh, huh, uh-huh. kind of laugh. Yeah, and um, and then tentatively is like, sure, sure, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. It'll, be, it'll be our little secret. Like, of course, yeah. I'm uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm covering it up by agreeing to everything you say. Exactly. And so the woman gets up to leave saying, you know, you have my pager number and have fun. And as she leaves, we see that her purple jacket is paired with a very short black skirt. And I I love my notes. She goes, Phoebe says a quick, you too, as they walk away, but doesn't look very happy about the job that she's just accepted. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we cut to a rice Roni street car heading away from us, which brings our total up to 15. And then another coming toward us. So now we're up to 16. That's awesome. After our rice Roni street cars, we get an exterior shot of a building that turns out to be an apartment building. And inside an apartment that has purple walls, a Buddha statue, incense burning, and a purple chair that I would kill to have, we see a woman trimming a plant with scissors. And she's wearing red on red, like it looked like a red velvety dress with like a red silky robe and red jewelry. Yep. Because, you know. And she's got a black asymmetrical bob. Mm-hmm. And some pretty heavy makeup. Yep. Well, lip. Yeah. And she gives some pretty heavy lip. Uh-huh. With like, a beautiful accent. Mm-hmm. It was, it was we, kind of British-esque. Yes. Yeah, so we gather that this is Zoe. Mm-hmm. And we see the demon... Yes. Appear behind her. Yes. And since we now know his name from the Book of Shadows as Barbus, I am perfectly fine calling him Barbus. Okay. Even though they never call him that. That's fair. But we read it in the book, so I'm okay with it. And she's all, I thought you might come. There's nothing here for you. You know. But he says that she couldn't be more wrong, that all he needs is for her to be alone. And then she says that he has no power over her. Because she has evolved to a place where she has released all mortal fears, and her inner strength will destroy him. And her attitude is just super eye rolly. Yeah, her attitude She's is very, very much holier than thou. Yeah, it's very much like, a. I'm super. I'm better than than man. anyone else. Man, man, man. Yeah. <laughs> and Barbara's son passes his hand across his face, showing the shadow over hers. And she has a momentary look of worry as he makes the flame from the candle fall onto the carpet, which she tries to stamp out with her foot. Well, the flame doesn't fall. It shoots to the carpet. Yes. The flame the flame on the candle, like, zooms up. To, yes. Because clearly it's a Bunsen burner hidden inside a wax taper. Well, of course. And then it shoots onto the thing, and she uses her bare, yeah, to- her painted toenail bare foot, foot to, like, try and rub it out. Not stamp. Rub. Yeah. She's trying to rub one out. Uh Uh-huh. And it's super ineffective. Yeah. And he says that she didn't release her fear of fire. She only repressed it. And the fire spreads and flames surround her. And she cries out with a little, no, please. And he tells her to save it for another lifetime. (laughs) And she's acting like her stomach hurts or something instead of acting like she's dying in a fire. But whatever. Well, I mean... They don't die of the thing they're afraid of. They die of fear. fear. Yeah, but, like, dying of fear does not mean your stomach hurts. Like, I just... It was the way she was acting was just odd. Well, stress makes you do all kind of weird things. I guess. Because it would be, like, some super amounts of adrenaline. I guess so. And cortisone? I don't know. There's another stress hormone. Okay. Um, But, yeah. He then says she's frozen in fear, and we cut to outside in the hallway... And Prue walks up and knocks on the door and calls out a hello. And then we cut back inside. Where Zoe screams. Uh Uh-huh. Prue hears this and magics the door open. Yeah, even though we hear no sound in the hallway when she's out there. There's absolutely no sound happening when we cut to Prue. 
but she supposedly hears this scream that ends before we cut back to Prue. Mm -hmm. It was weird. And so, yeah, so she magics open the door, and she walks inside. And Zoe is lying in a smudged Mm. circle. Yeah. Like, it's not even It's a ring of smoke and scorch marks. It's barely even scorch marks. It's like someone just took, like, a little bit of crushed up charcoal and drew it (laughs) with their fingers. Yeah. Like, it's, it's bad. It's not, it's not distinct. It's just kind of like, oh, look, it's really dark over here. But not, like, really dark, just, like, kind of dark. Like, we want it to look smoky, but we don't want to have actual smoke. Yeah. And she's lying dead on the floor in the middle of the ring with her eyes wide open and a wig of white hair. Mm-hmm. And, and again, commercial break. you can see her sideburns. Yep. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Super okay. bad wig. Another super, super bad wig. Slightly more realistic because her sideburns are mostly covered. Yeah. And it's at least the same texture as her hair. Ish. Ish. It's still clearly synthetic. Well, yeah. But then we get a commercial break. And we come back. We get a quick establishing shot of the building before we're back in the apartment. Hi, Blue. Did, did you not have your ear? <laughs> What'd you smell, Poppy? <laughs> What'd you smell? Probably the muffins. Or the chips. And the police and photographers are there. Oh, sorry. Crisps. Crisps. Police and photographers are there. And I always think it's interesting the things that I write in my notes. Because none of them are wearing booties over their shoes. CSI would be very upset with these people. Oh, yep. But at least the one guy in the background who's, like, wiping for fingerprints is wearing gloves. So there's that. Small favors. Yeah. And Andy walks up to Daryl, who gives him an odd look about his shoes. We see the shoes. See they're dirty white sneakers instead of his dress shoes, so I understand the look. Daryl is in a gray jacket, white shirt, black pants, and a patterned tie. CSI would be especially miffed about Andy's shoes. Well, yes. But Andy apologizes for being late and asks what they have, and Daryl tells him that the coroner said that there are no burn marks on the body and that she didn't die of smoke inhalation. How would they know that? Also, coroner? Yeah, I know. It should be medical examiner, but apparently California's weird. Whatever. And he well, says, they call them inspectors. Yeah, exactly. And he says that her heart gave up just like the others. Gave out? Gave up. <laughs> what? He said gave up. He said gave up. He said gave up. What? He said, I'm fairly certain that he said gave what? up. What? I, I'll be honest, I could be wrong, but I'm fairly certain he said, said it gave up. And that he also can't believe that Andy is wearing his cereal shoes, air quotes. Which and, cereal does he mean? Yeah. And Andy says that they're his good luck charms, and Daryl says they're embarrassing. Because they are. Mm Mm-hmm. And Andy says that this is the fifth woman with ties to the occult that's been found dead since midnight. Which means that another woman died post-confronting Prue. Mm Mm-hmm. So Barbus is, you know, doing his job. We've seen two deaths out of five. Yep. So it's it's nice to know that he's just not literally going after the people we see. Yes. Because that would just be annoying. Yes. And also, how the fuck would he get to 13 if he's only got two by noon? Yeah, absolutely. And he says, you know, tell me that's not the work of some serial nutcase. To which, of course, Daryl says that he can't, but that just still doesn't mean that the shoes aren't embarrassing. <laughs> which was very funny. So maybe that's the kind of serial he means. Yes. And a cop calls Daryl over to have a look at something, and he goes to talk to him. And Andy... Looks under the sheet that's covering the body, and we get a lovely insert shot of Zoe. And just like with Tangela, we can see her sideburns aren't white, which is an easy mark that she's wearing a wig. Well, also the the hairline. Well, yeah, that too. And then Daryl comes back and says the doorman keeps a visitor sign-in log. And guess who the last person to see the victim was? And Andy, Andy very reasonably it's says the it's killer. the killer. And, and Daryl's like, dude, it was it fucking Prue. Prue. Yeah. Fucking again. Yeah. He tells it to him gently. It was a gentle telling. I, well, he he's clearly also fed up with this coincidental shit. Yeah. And then we cut to Quake. Mm-hmm. And Prue and Phoebe and Piper are sitting at a table with salads in front of them. Mm-hmm. Clearly having lunch. Uh-huh. And Piper is now in a little black dress. So she's getting ready for the fundraiser tonight. Which we find out later is actually a top and a skirt, but... Yeah. And Piper asks... What she told Andy, and Prue says that she didn't even talk to Andy because she she didn't didn't want him to know that she was anywhere near there. Apparently she forgot about the sign-in log. Apparently. 
But, you know, she says that she called 911 and left. And Phoebe then asks if she's okay. And Prue says she is. But that she can't get Zoe's face out of her mind. And she starts to elaborate. And Phoebe shuts her down. Like, I'm terrified enough. Thanks so much. And asks, now what? And Piper says that they avoid any place that he can use to terrorize them. And Phoebe asks about all the other witches. And Prue says that she took Zoe's day runner because some of the names in there have got to be witches. And day so she'll mar- start making phone calls. Day yeah. planner, I understand. Well, Date book, I understand. Day runner? Yeah, I think day runner was like a brand of day planner. Oh, okay. I think. Okay, that would make sense. I'm not positive on that. I don't know. Yeah, day runner is a brand of day planner. But yeah, so she says she took the day runner, she'll start making calls, and then she reaches for the salt and knocks the jar over, spilling some out, and Piper tells her to quickly throw some over her shoulder, and Prue tells her not to be ridiculous, and Piper says that it's bad luck and she could get attacked by evil spirits. And then Prue, you know, condescendingly, like, sets the other shaker down, and she's like, listen, Pipes. Yeah. Yeah. And just gives her a super talking to. Yeah, like, we've been attacked by plenty of evil spirits that had nothing to do with salt. Bitch. Bitch. Yeah. And, you know, that considering their power, she can't believe that Piper wants to rely on superstitions for their protection. But Piper says that her feeling is, you can never be too rich or too safe. And I like this feeling. It's very smart, this feeling. Yes. I like it. Although I would argue you can be too rich. No. You can never be too rich. Well... It is the question of what you do with your riches. At some point, you can be so rich. Well, it it varies from person to person, but at some point, you can be so rich, you have no idea how to deal with real life. Yeah, see, that's not being too rich. No, this is true. That's that's being stuck up. That's being other things besides too rich. Okay. Because if I had enough money that I didn't know what to do with myself, I could find something to do with it. Oh, yeah. I would build houses for people who need houses. I would, you know, I would give money to shelters and to, you know, other things that need money. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a there's a lot of stuff. I would, you know, give money to people to, to fund research for stuff that doesn't have research for it yet. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, if I had all the money in the world, if I had unlimited amounts of money, I could absolutely figure something to do with it all. It's funny when people say all the money in the world, because that means they're taking all of the money from all of the other people in the world. Yes. Semantically, at least. At least. Yeah. Because then you have all the money. How much money is there actually in the world? Has anyone calculated that? I assume they have. I just haven't seen a calculation. I don't know. Because we know, like, countries' GDPs and shit. But that's not how much money there is in the world. No. And Mm. also, like... There, it could just be, like, the physical money that has been printed and is, in cur- and is currently in circulation. Or, it could be the value of the Earth if you were to sell it to an alien species for raw mineral, <laughs> for raw materials. Or it could be both. Yeah. Because there is literal money in the world, and there is money literally in the world. Yes. Let's add the two up. Let's not. Someone calculate that. Yeah, somebody else can do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, we know what the current value of... Iron and nickel and gold is. Hmm. And we know their relative amounts based on the periodic table. I know that's somehow calculable. I don't know why. We we have established that math is not my strong suit. So This is partially math, partially chemistry. Yep, that isn't my strong suit either. Same. Yeah. But back to the show. Phoebe sees a ladybug, a lovely CGI ladybug, on the plant on the table. And she announces it to her sisters and Prue, trying to needle Piper a bit. Like, is that bad luck? luck? Yeah. And Phoebe's like, no, it's actually good luck. Graham's told me that the direction it flies, you can find your ideal mate. Hey, let's try it out. And then and she flicks, flicks it. The ladybug yeah. off oh, of oh the floor. Oh, my God. I know. I know it's a CGI ladybug, but it's... Oh. And she wasn't exactly, like, super flicky. It was just like... Boop. Yeah. Right, Blue? And then he heard me shouting and he thought something was wrong. You're good. You're fine, baby. Go back to sleep. But yeah, Piper pulled the most adorable face when Prue asked if it was bad luck, too. It was just super duper cute. Like, mmm. Yeah. And so Phoebe flicks the, the ladybug and it flies across the room and nice lands and CGI. on Lucas. And it's not to scale as it's flying. Now, doesn't that mean that Lucas would be Phoebe's ideal mate? Because she's the one that flicked the ladybug? <laughs> just saying. And Piper then covers her face in a gasp of surprise. 
And Prue asks if a positive superstition cancels out a negative one. Piper says she doesn't know, and Phoebe asks what's going on. Because <laughs> Phoebe's got no clue. Yeah, she was not privy to that particular uh-huh. conversation. Yes. And Prue tells her that Lucas has been trying to talk to Piper all day, and she's been avoiding him. And as she's talking, a waiter trips and spills his tray of stuff all over Prue. And so Phoebe and Piper try to wipe her up with some napkins. And Piper tries to give the I told you so. Yeah. And who's like throwing the salt? She's like, don't go there. I'm going home to change. Yes. And shower. Yeah. And Phoebe tells her to be careful and calls out an I love you. And Prue throws up her hand and says, yeah, as she leaves. And Piper is now convinced that Prue cannot say the words I love you and thinks that she may be afraid that it'll make her look too vulnerable because ever since their mom died, she's been the strong, strong one, one taking care she's of them. She's been the tower. Uh-huh. And Phoebe thinks that she might be right and then realizes that she has to get back to work. Yeah, how is she at lunch if she's the only one in the office? Who knows? If her job well, is to answer but, phones when they call. But if if they're, if that job has a lunch hour... Like, you must break for lunch. I kind of see that. Like, we are close between the hours of, you know, noon and two for lunch. Okay, if they're, like, officially closed for those yeah. hours, yeah, I can That's see that. That's the only but reason i be okay fun. with it. It's still strange to me with, like, Phoebe's the only one there. Yeah, but she's not the only one there. Well, there's other people, but for some reason, like, she was handed the, the keys. keys. Yeah, well, you know. Like, there's a bunch of extras milling about in the background... But yeah. Phoebe is the only one working there today. Yeah. I don't know. But Piper asks how the new job is going, and Phoebe says that it's great, except that her new boss wants to lie to her husband about the affair that she's having. And Piper sarcastically comes back with, Oh, how nice. And then asks what she's going to do. And Phoebe says that she doesn't know, and she's hoping it never comes up. And she gives a quick nod of the head towards Lucas and wishes Piper good luck in that cute sister way. And then she leaves... And Piper starts clearing the plates of uneaten salad. And Lucas walks up to her and asks how it's going. And she says that it's good. Then he asks her out to dinner after the fundraiser. And she says she has to check her schedule. And he's like, you don't know if you're free tonight? (laughs) And she falters for a moment and then notices that that CGI ladybug has come back to land on his shoulder. And then says, yeah, sure, let's do it. Yeah, dinner would be great. He says great and they exchange smiles. And then we cut back to SWA. Where the same lady passes. Uh-huh. I actually had that written down. I'd forgotten I wrote that down. Yep, same woman in blue walks by. And in my notes, I wrote, seriously, they couldn't have taken more than one exterior shot? Yep. Mm-hmm. That, well, they took two. They did, apparently. But I didn't know that at they the time. They couldn't take more than two. Yeah, I didn't know that at the time. Especially if they're going to show it twice. They should have at least shown the last shot. And then... Th- yeah, I don't know. Whatever. But inside... A man in a tan suit grabs some papers and walks through the office. And Phoebe is sitting at a desk. And we also see an open water bottle. Now that bottle either looks completely empty or more full than any water bottle should ever be. Either that or the water level is behind the label. Which I think is probably the case. At least in this particular shot, yes. But hey look, it's one of those red labels. And it looks like the label says Arbo Reap. What? Yep, so it's it's a doctored Arrowhead label bottle, <laughs> uh, which is awesome, because now that little bit of annoyance can be cleared from oh my, my brain. Oh my god, that's hilarious. But it really, really does. It says Arbo Reap, as, as opposed to Arrowhead, and it was fucking funny. Anyway, she's holding the coin charm like she's going to flip it, and is deciding that if it lands on heads, she'll tell the truth, and if it lands on tails, she'll lie. She flips it, flips it goes here. off the desk. Uh-huh. And, and so she, she walks, has to stand up. She to stands up, walks around the desk, mm-hmm. and b- you hear it, like, spinning. Mm-hmm. And then by the time she gets around the desk, the spinning is stopped. She says, well, that was helpful. Look down, you see, it's balanced on its edge. Yep. Super helpful. Yep. Thanks, coin. Yep. Hey, Blue? Yeah. And she picks up the coin as the phone rings. She reaches for the phone, knocks over the bottle of water, which was way more full than any open bottle of water should ever be. And it starts spilling out. And so she tells she tells the person on the phone <laughs> to hold, hold on, on, and picks the, up the bottle of water with two hands, one grabbing the actual bottle and, and one, one trying, trying to, to stop the, the water. water. Yeah, and touching the water gives her sort of the a vision of Prue 
in the shower, submerged in water, flailing about. Yep. And there's, like, a shampoo bottle floating around, yeah. And she tells whoever was on the phone that no one's in and they should call back later. And, and she she's like, up on them. Jo- uh, kind of stepping, but it looks yeah, like she's she, hopping back it around. It adorable little, like, hop steps, like, like skittering. Like, quick, quick step. It was, like, skittering. Like, bouncy skittering. Yeah. And so she hangs up on them and then makes an outgoing call. And we cut to the bathroom in the manor. And we see a pair of legs walking toward the shower. And I swear to God, there was a white spot on the right leg that made it look like foundation makeup was covering up something on the leg. It was a quick thing. I'm probably the only one who noticed it, but it did strike me as odd. Like, you know, whoever was Shannon's body double had a tattoo on her leg. Almost exactly where Alyssa's tattoo is. However, when we see the legs walk into the shower, we pan up to see Shannon, or, you know, Prue. So I guess that it wasn't a body double. So I don't know what that spot on her leg was supposed to be. But anyway, she gets in, turns on the water, and the phone rings. Then we get a quick insert shot of the answering machine as it picks up, and we see that the number on the caller ID says SWA Properties, and the phone number is 555-1212, which I haven't dialed in a very long time, but last I checked, that goes to directory assistance. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yet another 555 number. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Phoebe's voice comes over the machine as she's calling out to prove that she just had a premonition and she could be in trouble. And Barbus appears in a cloud of smoke, listens for a moment, and then does the hand pass thing he does. And the number on the caller ID disappears. And then back at SWA, Phoebe hangs up and grabs her coat. And then she's heading home. And we cut back to the bathroom. And Prue is enjoying her shower. And we get a panning shot where we see that the bathroom has stained glass windows, and the shot ends on Barbus. He does the hand thing, and Prue, who has had her eyes closed, finally opens her eyes and notices him standing there, and he says her greatest fear is drowning, and thanks for for making it so easy. At which point, the shower starts filling up with water. Uh Uh-huh. And, you know, Prue's panicking, but then she remembers, oh, I should turn off the taps. Yeah. Turns off the taps, very sensible, still filling up. Because this is not logical. It is a fear demon. Like, come on. And then, as it's getting higher and higher, she starts trying to, like, move him with her powers. Yep. And you hear the the sound effect. You see her squint. Nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. And he's again like, Your Your powers powers are frozen frozen by fear. fear. Yeah. And, um... Which, you know, she should have remembered, but she... You know, I'll forgive her. It's hard to remember things when you're scared. uh Yeah. It gets up over her head, mm-hmm. and first, I'm thinking, why doesn't she just float to the top? There's more shower stall. Like, this would not be hard. And then I'm like, oh, wait. If she floats any higher, we're going to see that Shannon's not naked. Yep. So, okay, I'll forgive that. Yep. But my favorite is, you know, the the water hasn't really gotten any higher, and yet she apparently can't stand anymore. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, and there's bottles floating in the water, which is just the funniest thing ever. Yeah. And she's losing the battle to stay course, calm. And of course, who has a completely watertight shower stall like that? No one. No one. No one. It's watertight against a spray. Yeah. Not against pressure. Like, she's banging on the door. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. But, you know. Doesn't the door open outward anyway? Yes, yeah. it does. So, banging on the door. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. But, so she's losing the battle to stay calm, and we cut outside the manor, where, a la convenience, Andy and Daryl are walking up to the door. And Daryl's asking Andy why he's so not, like, suspicious of Prue. Yeah. Andy wishes he could think of a logical explanation why Prue's involved in this. Danny says, (laughs) this time or every other time. Yeah, exactly. And it gets a smug smile from Andy, and then Daryl rings the doorbell, and we get a quick shot of the bathroom where Barbus is still feeding on Prue's fear, but has noticed the doorbell. Prue finally decides... To scream. To float to the top so she can get air yeah. and scream, which yeah. means we don't get a shot of her floating to the top, we just get a shot of her head above water. Yes. Because can't show that she's not naked. Exactly. But that scream can apparently be heard outside because Daryl gets out his gun and Andy kicks open the door and they oh, run I, in. I and, believe that. And yelling for Prue. Somehow know which bathroom she's in. Or that she's in a bathroom. Well, you know, a la convenience. Mm-hmm. Well, Andy probably knows the layout. He's been there a ton. Mm-hmm. They grew up together. Yes. And they've had m- much... Sex, sex together. Sex together, yeah. Well, usually not at her place. At least not that we've seen. 
And we don't know if it happened in high school. True. But yeah, back in the bathroom, Prue is barely keeping her head above the water, and then Barbus disappears, the door flies open, and Daryl and Andy run in, pointing their guns. And Prue Looking is around, around standing. And then, yeah, you get a shot of Prue with standing. With her eyes closed, and the water seems to have disappeared. And Andy asks if she's okay, and she replies that she doesn't know. And Daryl just looks a bit confused, motions that he's leaving, and Andy's like, I'll wait for you downstairs. And Prue grabs a towel that, for some fucking reason, was inside the shower with her. <laughs> was it hanging off the top of the door, or was it just hanging on a hook? Hanging on a hook inside the oh fucking shower. Oh, God. Like, who fucking does that? Like, God. I can't even. Yeah, I know. I can't even. I like, know. it annoyed me so much. I feel ya. So much. So much. But the reason... That she had to grab the towel and wrap it around her. Was so that was she so could, they could open the door. pan down when they yeah. opened the door. Yeah. They pan down to show that, no, not the water is gone. There's still like a good six or seven inches. Right. But if you look closely, you can see the water is being, is like bubbling up behind her. Yeah. Which is just And I'm just thinking, hilarious. holy shit, how she can avoid all that water damage. Yeah. Because that's going to go into the hallway. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah. And then they never talk about it again. They never mention it. Neither of the sisters is like, why is the bathroom rug all wet? Nothing. There's no mention of it again at all. We don't see a, a bubbling ceiling below. Yeah. Nope. Nothing. Mm. Oh, well. A la convenience. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Nice awkward moment. Mm-hmm. So she looks around a bit in shock, and then we go to commercial break. When we come back, we have another establishing shot of the manor. And in the living room, Prue is now sitting on the couch wearing a gray robe over a white shirt and has a towel wrapped around her head. Is she still wrapped in the towel under the robe? No. Is that a shirt? Yeah, it was a white shirt with, like, oh. little scalloped... Oh, uh, okay, like so probably like a tank top, yeah. Yeah. Yes, but she is fresh out of the shower and fresh in makeup. Yeah. Yeah. Which, granted, the makeup didn't exactly wash off in the shower because she wasn't trying to wash it off, and I guess she was wearing waterproof mascara or some shit. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, somehow had time to put on makeup. Yeah. Because we can't show women without it. Yeah. Unless they're supposed to look sick. And even then, they're even still then wearing makeup. Even then, they put makeup. on makeup to look sick. They're not just wearing no makeup. Yep. I, the only thing I can think of where no one was wearing makeup was on something like We Should Start a Zoo. That movie with Scarlett Johansson and I think I've, Matt Damon. We Bought a Zoo? We Bought a Zoo, yeah. Yeah, no, I've never actually seen We it. Should Start a Zoo. <laughs> we should start a zoo. What? But yeah, we bought a zoo because she's like, no, fuck it. I'm not wearing makeup. You can deal, but I'm not doing that. Yep. Because this character would not wear makeup. Like, at all. Which, you know, we should do more often. Because, I mean, you think about it, like, even guys in movies are wearing makeup. No one looks that good, naturally. Yep. Well, some people do. But very, very few people. And I mean, like, one in a million. Yep. So, about 370 in the United States. Okay. There are 300, there are a little more than 300 people in the United States who look that good without makeup. I'm one of them, you know. Well, who's gone through puberty. I don't trust people who are, like, in middle school who don't look awkward. (laughs) It's a phase you have to go through. If there's not some awkward photos of you from middle school, like, now, you can look at photos while you're that age... And think, oh man, I look so awkward. But all your friends look fine. But then you look back at your friends and you're like, no, they were awkward too. Yeah. I just wouldn't have noticed it. Yeah. But everyone looks awkward in middle school. Mm-hmm. It just is. Yep. If you don't, there's a problem. <laughs> I feel sorry for you. Okay. Who didn't look awkward in middle school. You never had to go through that pain? Yes. Anyway, speaking of pain... Andy no, fear. Asked, well, but Andy It wasn't what, pain, it was fear. Yes. Andy asked what she was screaming about, and she said she had soap in her eyes. Yeah. He asked her again, she confirms again. And then Daryl asked what she was doing in Zoe's apartment, and Prue has to think for a moment before coming up with the lie that, that Zoe was a collector of occult items, and she wanted to know if the auction house was interested in selling them for her. She's not looking either of them in the eye. Yep. Daryl asks if Zoe was alive or dead when she got there, and Prue says that she was dead. 
And Andy asked why she didn't leave her name when she called 911 and why she left before the cops got there. Because she wanted to avoid this, she says. Uh Uh-huh. Which, you know, is just stupid. Yeah. You're going to have to deal with it sooner or later. Yeah. You know you signed some shit. Even if not, you know there's probably going to be cameras. Because there's got to be some reason for Andy and Daryl to come to your house. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And Andy thinks it's a little coincidental that she's been one step ahead of death twice in a day. And Prue wants to know what he's implying. Like, you know. Prue, what would you do if you were in my shoes, seeing all of this? And she, she goes, was, first of all, yeah, no, no one, one should be, be in those, those shoes. shoes. Which gets a little funny mock whisper of, told you, from Daryl. Yeah. Which was hilarious. Oh my god. Yeah, and that, that, was, that was how I wrote it. No one should be in those shoes. Teen, teen, told you. Yep. And Prue goes on to say that if she were in his shoes, that she would never think he had anything to do with these deaths. You're missing the uh, head tosses that Kat is doing. Yeah. And trust me, they are glorious. Yes, thank you very much. And Andy tells her that five women her age have been scared to death since midnight, and when they showed up and heard her screaming, they broke in to find her terrified in the shower. And she once again tries to say that she just had soap in her eyes, and Andy says, that wasn't pain on your face, it was fear. And we hear the front door open and slam shut, and Phoebe runs into the living room calling for Prue, and she stops short when she sees She kind of slides the into, the, into yeah. the archway of, of the sitting room. Yep. It's great. Yep. And she's, like, holding out her purse, and she's like, oh, hi, hi guys. Yeah. She says, she says hi, and they both go, hi. Hi. Yeah. So they exchange their quick hellos. Phoebe asks if everything's okay, and Prue says everything's fine, and asks if the cops are done with her. And Daryl says they are, and they leave. And as soon as they're gone, Prue's like, you would not believe what happened to me. And Phoebe's like, oh, I would. I saw it. Which I thought was funny. And Prue takes the towel off of her head. And Phoebe says that he must have come really close because she's got some white in her hair. And she goes over to the mirror to to find she is now in with the skunk look. Yeah, it's a bright white little bit on her normally black hair that looks like it was sprayed on. Yeah, it's it's uneven. Looks like they got a lock... Like, they just picked up a, a random section and bunched and it together it. and sprayed it. Yeah. Because it's, it's not even a completely solid streak no, it was in her more hair, kind which of... I think was more interesting. Yeah. But yeah, the skunk look is totally in now, but not in 1999. Not so much. And then we time lapse up. We cut to Prue and Phoebe walking into the attic. And we and see that Prue's hair is dried. Uggs. Well, her hair is dry and she's wearing Uggs. Wait, were Uggs around back then? Yes. Fucking Uggs. And Phoebe says that there has to be something in the book about releasing fears, that it may not be obvious, and she walks over to the Book of Shadows, and Prue apparently smells something like sandalwood in the attic and asks Phoebe about it, but Phoebe doesn't smell anything. And in the close-up shot, the white in Prue's hair now looks more like a light gray. It's much less bright and noticeable. And Prue says that their mom used to wear a fragrance like that, and Phoebe's like, I was too young to remember... And she looks at the book and finds the page that Prue had been looking at and is confused. Yeah. Because there's another Prue's like, there's nothing about releasing your fear. And there is now a new line that says, to let go of your fear, trust in the greatest of all powers. And, and Prue is very, very adamant about that, that this was not in there. Yeah. We know she's right. But Phoebe's like, well, honey, you were stressed. Yeah. Maybe like, all that how stress. Do we know? And Prue's like, it's in mom's handwriting. I would have remembered. Playing bitch step off. Uh Uh-huh. And Phoebe asks what she thinks that the greatest of all powers is, that maybe it's the power of three, and Prue's like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And Phoebe, sensing that something's up, asks about it, and Prue says that she can feel their mom's presence, and Phoebe, not believing that that's what's really going on, says that maybe Prue should get dressed and go to Buckland's, but Prue doesn't think she's up for that. And Phoebe realizes that because he disappeared once Andy got there, that Barbas only attacks when you're alone and your fear is at its greatest. Well, more like, so there's no witnesses. Yeah. And Prue Prue says she's right, which gets an, of course I am, from Phoebe, which was just great. Also, no help. True. Yep. Because if there's someone else there, they're not frozen fear because it's not necessarily their Their fear. fear. Also, there's no point in killing them because they might not be a witch or single. So it's really just efficiency. Mm -hmm. We don't know how many people he's gotten by this point. True. Very true. But yeah, we get a cute, of course I am, when Prue says she's right. And then she tells Prue to stay away from water. Any water. Don't even drink it. (laughs) Which I thought was very funny. Mm -hmm. But that means don't drink anything, because you can drown drinking anything. Mm -hmm. Just saying. 
But Prue tells her not to worry. And Phoebe says, I love you. And Prue replies, me too. As she's flipping through the book. Uh-huh. And Phoebe thinks about it and then stops and asks her if she knows that she does that. Yeah, it's like, why do you why do you never say I love you? Prue's like, dude, I just did. And no, like, you said me too. Uh-huh. I mean, she obviously confuses the the sentiment with, with the, the words. words. Yeah. Like she thinks because she's, you know, reflected it back. Exactly. And it counts. And you know, in some it respects kind of it does, does. But yeah. But but also like I, I understand. Yeah. Like, it's it can be difficult to say. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when those specific words are the problem. Because, exactly. Because, as we learn, they mm-hmm. were the last things she said to their mother before mom died. Exactly. And then Phoebe goes over and gives Prue a hug, and we see that they're both trying not to cry. Mm-hmm. It's adorable. It's sweet. And then we cut to Quake. Because <laughs> you can't stay in one place too long. Well, no, it just it just sounded like you were trying to make them completely opposite things. It's adorable. It's sweet. And then we cut to Quake. <laughs> yeah. 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 So this is where my, my notes come up of a bartender that isn't Doug is putting drinks on a tray. I still think that waitress is Shelly from last time, but she isn't called by name in this episode, and my facial recollection is crap. I don't think it was her. I'm sorry, what? I don't think it was her. <laughs> Said to replace the one I said when I was yawning. Yes. Then Piper walks toward the dining room and sees Lucas and turns toward the bar, <laughs> which was funny. A woman dressed up as a black cat is about to walk past her, and Piper asks her to walk behind her so that she doesn't cross her path. Not sure that the person dressed as a cat counts as a cat in, in that particular superstition, but okay, Pipes, what if? Well, it's the theme. She's going with it. I can, I like, even if she wasn't a big believer in superstitions, I can see this one event, like, freaking her the fuck out. I guess so, but I like, don't know. She got caught up. Yeah. But so, Black Cat Lady says okay and starts to leave, but Piper stops her short because she's dropped her tail. And Piper as she leans down, down, down to, to grab it, it yeah. you hear a ripping sound. You see nothing. Yeah, you see but absolutely Piper nothing. Piper grabs, like, the si- side the, of her grabs skirt. at her hip. Yep. Like, at the side of her skirt. You can presume, okay, that's where that happened. Yep. And she gives her the tail... And then the girl looks really happy, goes yeah. and walks off. Yeah. And then Piper walks toward the kitchen, walking past Lucas, who she's been trying to avoid, and who, a la convenience, doesn't notice her. Just saying. She goes in the kitchen, walks over to one of the shelves, grabs the shoebox that we saw earlier, and gets out a smudge stick and a note card that I'm assuming has the directions on it of how to use the smudge stick, mm-hmm. which and- is literally light on fire, whoosh round room, well, like no, it's, incense. It's the, the incantation as well. Oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But Doug's there, right, then, yeah? Yeah. He, he walks behind her. Yeah, that's when Doug walks up. And, like, is like, does the, like, are you okay kind you of deal? seem tense. Yeah, and, like, legit, I totally thought he was going to try and hit on her. Like, that's what that seemed like. No, man, like, he's engaged. No, I know, but, like, the way he came up was like, are you okay? You seem tense. Like, it was that little moment of, like, is he going to try and rub her shoulders right now? Like, mm-hmm. that's... <laughs> Like, brown chicken, brown cow. Like, that's, you know, like, where, where <laughs> her brain went, you know? Oh, <sighs> I haven't heard anyone use brown chicken, brown cow since middle school. You're welcome. <laughs> well, no, that's a lie. No. One of the, like, however many jokes in four minutes thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that Hank does. Yeah. I, that that was the last time I heard it since middle school. So that and this was like, is the last time I've heard like three it years in the last, ago. like, three years. So. Yeah. Unless go. I watched it, like, last year to watch all of them. Yeah. So yeah, so Piper says that ever since she agreed to have dinner with Lucas, she's had a run of bad luck, including a broken nail, a late shipment of clams, having to fire a hostess, as well as her skirt just ripping. And Doug just chalks it up to it being Friday the 13th. Well, he's like, well, you know it's Friday the 13th, right? Yeah. No, we were having this whole superstition event, and it didn't occur to me what the (laughs) reason would be. Yes, Doug, I fucking knew. I run this place. Yes. Who handles the books? You're looking at her. Exactly. And an off-screen call of order up makes him leave to go back to work, and Piper lights the smudge stick with the flames from under a pot of boiling water on the stove, and she starts waving, waving it, it in the air and says the words from the note card, which is, Sage so fair, fair. from far and wide, take my troubles and brush them aside. Well, she says, brush them aside. <laughs> and then the smoke detector goes off, and the kitchen staff starts wondering about a fire, and she quickly puts Piper out the looks, smudge stick. Well, Piper, like, the, the face Piper is pulling is the best. <laughs> because she stops and she's like, a little deer in headlights, like, 
oh fuck, is that me? Shit, that's me. And then turns me. around and she's like, shit, that's me. As people are like, where's the smoke? Are we on fire? Yeah. And then dips the smudge stick in the boiling water, clearly getting her fingers to. Yeah. Now, granted, this was clearly a pot that was just hooked up to a bubbler. Yeah, well, absolutely. So, you, no damage. She dips it in, pulls it out, and then her face just goes, ow! Oh! Yeah. And it, there's like a delayed yelp. Yeah. It was yep. great. Apparently it's just not her day. Yeah. But the funniest part about that to me is like, you just lit the tip of it. Why would you stick the whole damn thing in the water? Mm-hmm. She's panicking. Yeah. And then we cut back to SWA properties. and There's in, a second shot. Yep. In my notes, I was like, oh, look, they did take more than one shot. This time, there's a man and a woman walking by. It would have been funnier for me if they had done first shot, second shot, then first shot again. Yeah, exactly. That would have been hilarious. That that would have been a little bit more logical to me than first shot, first shot, second shot. It would have made more sense than they're like, yeah, we could totally pull this off, and then, like, you would catch it. Mm-hmm. I would po- possibly catch it. Yeah. Nitpickers pickers would catch it. Absolutely. But yeah, it just was like, really... You had, like, one right after the other of the thing, and you yeah. had the same person walking by, but you had a secondary shot? Like, why did you not use that one? Rawr. But, yeah. Anyway, so Phoebe's sitting at a desk reading some papers when a man walks in, and he says he's looking for Susan, which is apparently the woman in the purple jacket. And Phoebe says that she's not here and asks for his name, and he says his name is Richard Warner, which apparently makes him Susan's husband. And he makes a joke about her having one he doesn't know about. And Phoebe tries to laugh it off awkwardly. Yep, it's awkward and slightly adorable. It's like, dude, she doesn't no, have another husband. No, like there's a hand waving. Yeah, it's very funny. And Richard says that he thought he'd surprise her and take her to dinner and ask Phoebe if she knows, you know, where Susan is. She's and like, oh, she, oh, she's she went out. Yeah. It's like, you said like, that already. We, we've established that. Do you know where? And, and she for tries some reason, to Phoebe step says, yes. Yeah. Well, she tries to step around it, and then she decides that she can't be the assistant that his wife wants without compromising her beliefs, and she just won't do that. So she gets up, and she starts writing on some kind of post-it, like, Susan. Yeah, she's, like, writing a note. And, and he's and like, he's like, slow down, like, and, and she's like, don't worry about the office, I'll lock up. And she's gathering her things, and then he thanks her. And she's like, for what? And he's for not lying to me about her affair. Which he has apparently known about, but tried to lie to himself. Yes, he's tried to deny it. it. But there comes a time when you have to face the truth. Yes. Uh-huh. And, you know, Phoebe says that she's sorry, and he tells her not to be and not to quit on his behalf. And she goes, I'm not. Which I thought was funny, because in my brain, I, like, I've forgotten that she basically goes back to work. But, like, at first my thought was, she's not quitting. Like, I'm not quitting on your behalf. I'm quitting because I can't, like, deal with this woman. Yeah. But instead she's like, okay, I'm not quitting. I mean, you could take that either way. Well, because... Like, reassuring him, no, I'm not quitting just because of this. Like... Right, but then she sits down and, like, puts her stuff back down and goes back to work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And she's not working there the next episode, so... Well, you know, there's that. But he leaves and the phone rings. So she puts her things down, answers the phone, and a woman's voice comes through the phone asking for Susan. And Phoebe's like, she's not in. Can I take a message? And the woman on the phone says that her name is Mrs. Joffy, like coffee with a J, and that she's outside a house that Susan's supposed to show her, but Susan's not here. Like how Javna has an N. Yes. It's Java with an N. Exactly. A lot of coffee. Crazy yeah. things. Do you drink diesel? <laughs> exactly. No, think. no, no one no. drinks leaded. Nope. I don't drink coffee at all. But Phoebe apologizes and says that Susan must have forgotten because she's out for the rest of the day. And Mrs. Jockey says she flew in from L.A. just to see this house and that she's under a time constraint. And Phoebe's like, well, nobody's here. But since you flew in just to see it, I guess I could show you the property and then ask for the address. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And we get an exterior shot of the property, and it's like a combo of like Tudor and brick, or as my mother called it, an abomination. <laughs> well, it is San Francisco. Yeah. So Phoebe has apparently taken one of SWA's cars to the property, and she walks past the garage doors and up to the fence and into the yard, calling for Mrs. Joffe, and she hears a female voice behind her saying, Hello, dear. And she turns around and is startled to see that it's Barbus imitating a woman's voice. He grabs her, and she tells him to let go or she'll scream, and he says he could use the fix. Which I thought was funny. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I totally laughed at that line. And then he does the hand thing, and Phoebe says that she knows how he kills, but there's no elevators around. And he laughs because, oh, really? You think that's your worst fear? Yeah. And you he, like, mortals wait. need to look deeper. And then he waves his hand over, and this time yeah. they have an actual shadow. Well, yeah. Well, uh, a little augmented, but, like, it actually makes a shadow over her face because of the way that the lighting is. Mm -hmm. So, th because she's not, like, far enough away that they would need to do the artificial shadow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were trying to make that realistic now. Who knows? Who knows? Don't care. Yep. And he's like, your worst fear is losing a sister. So I get two for one. Which yeah. I was just like... Two birds, one stone, yeah, baby. Yeah, like, all right, dude. Which means... The effort he puts into getting the two justifies the amount of time it takes. Yeah, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we cut to Buckland's via exterior shot. And inside where Prue is on the phone, presumably telling another witch to, like, avoid shit. She's like, uh -huh. don't look in any closets! Yeah. And I'm like, is this witch a lesbian and not telling anyone? Like, you know, why would she be afraid of closets? Well, you know. Well, claustrophobia, but still. Well, no. Some people think that, like, you know, the, the monster's in the closet, that kind of thing. I, I understand it. Oh, they like under the bed. Not everyone. Not all monsters like under the bed. All I know. Not all beds have an under the bed. This is true. Yeah. Mine currently does not, because there's so much shit down there. Exactly. Exactly. And Prue, in her office, which is the first time that we have seen her since the attic, no longer has gray in her hair. Well, it started to fade. Immediately. Which wouldn't it, fucking happen. Well, just maybe it's because saying. she lived. Just saying. Well, I mean, okay, remember episode five? One of the ones we all love to hate. The scratches on her back disappeared pretty quick. Yeah. Whereas but... when they're dead, their bones are all still broken. I guess so. And but... somehow not a mark on them, so that's slightly a continuity error. But whatever the fuck. She gets scratched, it heals super quick. Because it was, to a certain extent, not... All that real. So I can see them going like, well, it didn't work, she didn't die. So because it wasn't complete, it reversed. Yeah. It's an but, all or nothing. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, once the hair goes white, that pressure valve releases and you're dead. Yeah, I don't know. Personally, I think it would have been... I, I would have accepted it more had we had, like, a quick shot of her in the bathroom and all you see is, like, a box of hair dye on the counter. Like, then I'd have been okay with it. Like, I'm just going to touch up this little bit and get rid of it. But I digress. She's also wearing or a low-cut... Huh? Or a permanent marker. No, no, no. It'd smell horrible. No. Or, you know, just brushing her hair back. Yeah, if her hair was... It. Yeah, if her hair was, like, in a different style and you couldn't see it, mm -hmm. then I'd be okay with it. But it's in, it's just down, and you could totally... Yeah. Well, it also doesn't make sense that when it was wet, it was really white, and when it was dry, it was lighter gray. Yeah. So that, combined with the fact that it's not there anymore, I feel like they were trying to lead to the, oh, it reversed itself because it didn't work kind of deal. That's the direction I would think the show was trying to point. I don't However, know. However... They, they used their no elbow and didn't notice that their finger was pointing a different direction. Yeah. So they're like, there! Yes. Yeah. It, it... And their finger's pointing, but they're motioning with their elbow. And you're not always going to know it, because guess which way you look when someone is pointing? You look at their finger. Yes. Unless they don't have fingers. In which case, you look at whatever the most outward extremity is that they are currently moving. I wouldn't expect someone with no hands to be using their feet to point, unless their arms were busy. I, I don't know. I think this has taken I'm a turn. I'm overthinking this. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. I've got to overthink about this. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> anyway, she's wearing now a low-cut, long sleeve top that was either purple or blue. I, I think it was blue. Yeah, I couldn't really tell. Yeah, I think it was blue. Yeah. Not too worried about not, it. Not you. No, not you, Blue. Not you, Blue. It could be like a periwinkle. Yeah, maybe. I'd believe blue. But yeah, it's kind of low-cut. But when does Prue ever wear something work appropriate? Well, yeah, there's that. Anyway, so yeah, so the other line rings and she hangs up with the call that she was on and we hear Phoebe saying that she's gotten stuck at a house that she was showing and asked Prue to come and get her and Prue's like, okay, and asks where she is. And we cut back to the property and Barbus is on the phone imitating Phoebe's voice and he gives an address of 3112 Napa Street, so, in case you were wondering. And, okay, watching that actor with Phoebe's voice coming out of his mouth was delightful. d dash lightful. Got yes. it. And Prue says she's on her way and then we pan over to Phoebe who is tied up with tape over her mouth and is shaking and scared. And commercial break. Mm-hmm. And after the commercial bake, we are at Quake, because why wouldn't we be? But there are no extras that we recognize in this outdoor scene, which is a little weird, slightly disconcerting. 
And so at Quake, Piper is now wearing a gray dress and is sitting with Lucas, who is in a gray suit. And Piper says that she can't remember when she enjoyed a dinner more and is so glad he suggested it. And he says that he almost didn't because he got the sense that morning that she was totally turned off by him. And she replies, how odd. Which I thought was, odd. was really funny. That was what you were trying to communicate, girl. Exactly. And then she asks what it's like being one of the city's most eligible bachelors. And he laughs and says that the magazine article was so lame. He actually so said that. Lame. So <laughs> lame. He actually says those words. So lame. That he's really a simple guy who values home and hearth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that he wants to settle down and have kids. And then he has two nieces that he's crazy about. And he even carries pictures of them. In his wallet. Yeah. And, and she she's like, laughs and then freezes, freezes him. him. Yeah. Like, and she's like, you sound too good to be yeah. true. There's, I, I'm smelling something. Yeah. I don't know if I'm smelling anything, but I feel like I'm smelling something and I want to be careful. So she just reaches into his jacket and pulls out his wallet and looks through and sure enough, there's pictures of his nieces in there. Yep. She's like, you really you are, are the too, perfect man. Yeah. You are too good to be true. And, and as he, she's putting it back, yeah, he unfreezes he, and she pretends like there was some lint. Yes. It was so, like, it was just super funny. It was, was like, because... Her hand was definitely still in Inside his jacket. Inside jacket, yeah. Like, oh, you had a little bit of lint there. Just a little, little Also, bit. she's little suddenly, bit. like, all up in his grill yeah. when a split second ago she was not. Yeah, yeah. But people don't seem to, to you know, be annoyed or surprised or yeah. fearful of that at all. Nope, not at all. But he seems to buy the lint theory. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she says that he was right about her sending out negative vibes that morning. And when he asks why, she tells him about the superstition that any relationship started on Friday the 13th is doomed. And that there's another superstition about finding your ideal mate. And he cuts her off. And he seems to be upset that she was going to reject him because of one superstition. But then decided he was worth going out with only because of another superstition. Saying that doesn't say much for him. Which, I mean... Yeah. Mm. Like, that would not be the explanation I would have gone with as Piper. I would have been like, well, you know, this whole superstition thing is really getting to me because it's Friday the 13th, and my last relationship started on Friday the 13th. It did not end well. Yeah, exactly. I would have said that. I'd been like, and, you that know, Friday the 13th I, has its own connotations for me personally because yeah. of my last relationship. And and with all of, like, the black cats and the ladders and crap around yeah. and a lot of bad Luck has been happening to me today. Like, I'm just a little... A Shaky little, today. I'm just wondering whether or not this crap really works. And so, like, mm-hmm. I was worried about talking to you because of my previous relationship. And then someone told me about ladybugs and one landed on you. And, you know, I thought, well, if the bad luck is supposed to work, maybe the good luck should also work. Yeah, exactly. But she tries to say something else, and he cuts her off again and says, you know, I'm sure you're very nice and whatever, but that his last girlfriend was someone who let things like superstitions and omens determine in her life, and it was a disaster, so he's looking for someone who's just not into that stuff. Now, here's my question. If you're looking for someone who's not into this stuff, why are you hosting an event that is based around superstition? I just... I don't, I don't... I don't know. Yeah. Like, this entire... That entire scene... Whose idea was it? Because I know it wasn't Piper's, because she's freaking out about it. Well, he's the one hosting the fundraiser. Well, he's hosting the fundraiser. Did he decide on the theme? I don't know. I don't think he's planning the entire thing, and I don't think Piper's planning the entire thing. I think there's a party planner who decided to come up with this shit. I have no idea. But yeah. Who knows? But he apologizes, and then we cut to a night shot of the property... And Prue walks to the gate and calls out for Phoebe, who says she's in the backyard where apparently the view is great. Mm-hmm. And Prue, even at nighttime. Uh-huh. And Prue walks into the yard and calls out again while walking near the swimming pool. Mm-hmm. Turns around and sees Phoebe. Well, but, like, why she doesn't think that this is going to be problematic? She's walking toward a fucking swimming pool. Who yeah. knows? And then Well, she thinks Phoebe is there. Well, yes, but still. Well, Phoebe is there, but still. She thinks yeah. it's just Phoebe there. Right. And then she turns around to see Phoebe tied up. Wouldn't she have had to pass by, Phoebe? Well, hedges. I don't know. Like, there were some topiary things. Yeah, it's stupid. Yeah. But hey, um, so where does a fear demon get ropes and tape? Heebie-jeebie Hobby Lobby. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been sitting on that one? <laughs> Since last week. Nice. Yeah, that's going on Tumblr. Heebie-jeebie Hobby Lobby. 
I like it. But yeah, so she sees Phoebe tied up, and then Barbus comes into view, and he asks if she brought her suit before pushing her into the pool, where she promptly sinks to the bottom. Oh, Prue. She tries to swim back up to the top, but can't, and he tells her to feed him her fear. And we see Phoebe still sitting scared and shaky on the bench, and Prue is closing her eyes under the water, and then a bright light appears in the pool, and a voice calls to Prue, telling her to face her fears, and to trust in the greatest of all powers. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many takes it took to get her underwater for that long. I don't know. Was she, like, okay, so the way she's, like, flailing around and you know, kind of bouncing on the bottom. I'm thinking she's probably wearing a weight belt or something. Possibly. Because the amount of air in your lungs will make you float. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh-huh. The only the only things that won't make float are French bulldogs. What? Oh, they sink. They're too dense. What? Seriously. That's funny. I didn't know that. A lot of them can't swim. Aw, poor babies. And none of them can give birth. Their hips are too small. Because genetic modification. So how do you have more? Cesarean. Also, artificial insemination, because they can't fuck. Aw, poor babies. Yep. English bulldogs are the same way right now. Aw. Yep. That's kind of sad. Yeah. That's why the idea of, like, retro mops. So they they breed it back a little... They breed a little more variety in. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, try and get it back to a a previous standard. Because if you look at them from 100 years ago, you barely recognize them. Like, a pillow completely different. So they just try and get them a little... There's a lot of dogs that that do not look the way they looked 100 Uh years ago. It's terrifying how much we have bred dogs to be as adorable and cute as they are. Like, like pugs. Everybody everybody thinks pugs are adorable little dogs. And yes, they're super duper cute. But they're super unhealthy. Yeah, they are so unhealthy because they can't breathe. Mm -hmm. They can barely eat. Like, don't get pugs, people. Just don't do it. They intake so much air while eating that they're a constant fart machine. Yeah, like, just... just but a very, very not stealthy fart machine. Like, yeah. you can't set this off in a sleeping bag and scare Daniel Radcliffe. Like, <laughs> it won't work. Okay. Deep cuts. Deep, Deep cuts, cuts, man. Deep cuts. Anyway. So the voice in the pool tells her to trust in the greatest of all powers, which is love. Love. Uh-huh, which is a little bit of bullshit, but all right. And Prue sees a vision of a woman who she calls Mom, wearing a white dress. We can't see her face at all. The voice tells her to save herself, save her sister, and to not be afraid. And then the woman in white holds out her hand, and Prue reaches out and grabs it and gets pulled to the top. Mm -hmm. I want to know who did the voice for the mom. It does not say on IMDb. I'm not seeing anything online as to who voices it. It was probably someone vaguely connected with the show. Yeah, probably. But yeah, so she gets pulled to the top, and we see Barbus starting to move Phoebe somewhere, and Prue swims over to the edge of the pool and tells him it's over, and she uses her power, and he flies across the yard, and she gets out of the pool. She is so soaking wet that her shirt shines with the amount of water. And it's a little stretched, too. A little bit. And we can see her bra. Not until the next moment. Oh, is the continuity error? Yes. Oh. Yes. So... She, when she gets out of the pool, she is so soaking wet that her shirt is shiny. But by the time she gets to where Barbus is, which is, like, no more than, like, 15 feet away from the pool, she is no longer soaking wet. She's still wet, but she's no longer soaking, and her bra is showing. Yeah. And then he weakly goes, your fear. And she's like, I'm not afraid anymore. And then he screams for, no. For some reason, when she says, I'm not afraid anymore, the camera is not on her. It goes from him to Phoebe. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, it was a little odd, but I don't know. Like, you'd think that would be a great moment to show Shannon's face being all determined and shit. But they like might being, not have I'm had not that. I'm not afraid anymore! Yeah. Mm. But they might not have had that shot, so, you know, there's yeah. that. But he screams, no, and is vanquished. Now, let's talk about this vanquish, as it was very <laughs> oh elaborate. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. I had to write it all down, because it was very elaborate. I wrote annoying effect, annoyingly simple ending. Yeah. Yeah. So, here's the vanquish. Yeah. Okay. He turns red, explodes into red mist, which implodes into yeah, black it, little balls of matter. Yeah, it coalesces, implodes, and then there's a reverse mushroom cloud. Yeah, it, it, get, it's in, it gets enveloped into a white cloud and then gets pulled down into a puff of fire at the ground before ending in smoke. Yes. Yeah. So he's another one that cleans up after himself. Yeah. Although he wasn't actually destroyed, he was just He was sent. kind of banished. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't really vanquished, he was just kind of... Where did it va- say he comes from, did it say? I assume hell. Yeah, I don't know. Figured him in and all. Who knows? 
But spoilers, he comes back later. That's how we learn his name for realsies. Yeah. But as soon as he is is gone, the rope and tape magically disappears, CGI style, yep. from Phoebe. Yes. It, it was returned to stock at Heebie Jeebie Hobby Lobby. Yes. I came up with that because I was trying to figure out a pun for any, like, craft, craft or home improvement store. Mm-hmm. And I was like, uh, Menards, Ace, Hobby Lobby, Michaels, like, I'm trying to go through all of this. And then uh, and, uh, for my for Hobby Lobby, I'm like, heebie-jeebie, yeah, just tack it on. Heebie-jeebie Tacky Hobby. on! <laughs> anyway. So then Prue and Phoebe hug, not caring about the wetness of their clothes. Well, Prue's not wet anymore. Yeah. And Phoebe says that she was so scared, and Prue says that she knows, but she's glad that she's safe. And Phoebe says, I don't know what would ever happen if I lost you. You would have died? Well, there's that. And then she like, says, I love you. you would have died. Yeah. And then she says, I love you. And this time, Prue says, I love you back. And they laugh and touch their foreheads together. <laughs> I did not see that. Yeah, it was weird. It was a little weird. And then we cut to the manor via exterior night shot. And in the living room, Piper is sitting on the floor in front of a roaring fire... Tossing shit into it, mm-hmm. especially metal that the fire cannot possibly melt because a not hot enough, b it's falling to the floor of the yeah, house. Yeah, well, yeah, not on like the logs are suspended above because ash. Yeah, and she's in a greenish V-neck, long sleeve sweater and gray sweatpants. She got comfy quick. Yeah, and so she takes off the necklace she's wearing, she throws it in the fireplace, and Phoebe and Prue walk in, and Prue is now seemingly wearing Phoebe's jacket, and Piper is continuing to throw other things into the fire. Well, her jacket's probably at the bottom of the pool, and Phoebe didn't want to She wasn't in. wearing her jacket in the pool. She shrugged it off. Did she? Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, she did. You're right. You're right, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. It so rarely happens. That I miss something? Or that I forget something? No, yeah. it doesn't. That happens a lot. Well, it so, hap- it so rarely happens that I'm able to correct you. Oh, yes. Yes. Because normally it's in my notes. Yeah. And I didn't bother. I'm going to bother you about it. All right. So, Phoebe and Prue walk in, and Piper's still throwing stuff into the fire, and Phoebe asks what she's doing, and she says she's kicking herself because she just lost probably the greatest catch in San Francisco. Which... Well, that's because Leo's not there anymore. Correct. And Prue asks what happened, and Piper tells her that he doesn't like women who rely on superstitions to make decisions. And, you know, that he was probably right. And Phoebe tells her that Prue vanished the demon of fear. And Piper's like, what? Piper gets up quickly, and due to the camera angle, we get a lovely shot of her butt past the camera. Yup. It was funny. Because it's like, those sweatpants are awfully tight on her butt. Yup. But, you know... (laughs) <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um. But, um. Take a shot. We have shot glasses for that. You do. Well, there's one. I don't know where mm-hmm. yours is. It's on my house. Oh, okay. It's at home. It's on my bookshelf. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Phoebe says that Prue vanquished him, and Prue says that she at least put him back in the bottle for another 1,300 years. Which, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so now Piper is the one who's asking what happened, and Phoebe starts the story saying that he pushed her into the pool... And then Prue finishes with, and mom helped me out, which my mother lovingly said, then she didn't do anything. <laughs> like, she didn't do it. <laughs> she had to have she, help. She, she so tossed it? Barbus away. Yeah. But was it, it was the, the, she didn't conquer her fear. She had help. Like, well, you know, sometimes you need help to conquer your fear. Yeah. Yeah. She was just lucky in that, you know, ghost of mom was around. Exactly. But, so Piper questions her about it being mom, and Prue says that, you know, she knows it sounds crazy, but it was just like her dream, that she was an incredible vision, so peaceful, and she took my hand and brought me to the surface. And Piper says, you know, that it doesn't sound crazy, that she wishes she could have seen her, and Mm. Phoebe agrees as well. And Piper says she's just glad that Prue's all right, and they hug. And And then Prue Prue says... Unprompted, says, says, I I love love you. you. And and gets an eyebrow raised from Phoebe... And causes Piper to break the hug with a, what did you just say? Which I thought was really funny. Yeah. And Prue repeats, I love, I love you. you. Yep. And then Piper gets, like, really cute. Yeah. And, and she's like, they all smile. never said that to me. Yeah. Like, oh, and she's doing this, like, funny thing with her shoulder. Yeah. It's so it was, cute. It's it so adorable. cute. She's so happy. It was so adorable. And Prue wishes that she had said it a long time ago, but ever since their mom died, 
She's been afraid to say it because she didn't want to lose anybody else. And Piper's like, we're not going anywhere. And then Priest says that she's exhausted and she'll see them in the morning and she leaves the room. And Piper turns to Phoebe and is like, what happened to her in that pool? And Phoebe says she doesn't know, but whatever it was must have been incredible. And we cut to the attic for the final scene. Where Prue where... is sitting in a chair with the book. <laughs> And a grandfather clock that I don't remember ever seeing before chimes the hour. And she's in the chair holding the Book of Shadows. And she's back on the page written in her mother's handwriting. And the words magically appear on the page. A a, a little uh, orb of light comes and cursives on the page. Uh-huh. Thanks for letting them into your heart. Which we as, hear as the, the voice. voice from the pool saying that. And Prue says, I miss you, Mom. And we go to the end credits. Right, please? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Yes, I love you. And that means we're done. Yeah. It's time for the rating. Uh-huh. So am I going first this time? Or would you like to go I'll first? I'll go first. I think you went first the last couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give it eight and a half out of ten unhelpful coin tosses. Nice. I went for eight out of ten uncontorted fear faces. <laughs> and then as for outfits, for Prue... I actually really like the white hoodie that she was wearing in the very first scene. I feel you. Uh, I think my favorite of Prue's was the sweater. But, you know, the wet sweater. That yeah. was nice. Yeah. Phoebe, definitely her suit. Yeah. Because that's... Actually, that's the, only, the outfit. only outfit. Yeah. That was the only outfit she wore the entire episode. Holy shit. Yeah. Although I do love that jacket. Yeah. But that's part of the outfit. But yeah, it was basically the only Holy outfit that she's shit, in that the never entire happens. episode. Yeah, Even exactly. Piper changed. I know, right? Piper changed twice. She had three outfits. Yeah, three outfits. No, four. She changed the, oh, the yeah, top four. of the skirt. She had four. four. She had four outfits and Phoebe had one? Yeah. What is this nonsense? Yeah. Crew had three. Yeah. Well, robe, four. And naked. You know, there's that. Yeah, that's not an outfit. <laughs> the towel. Well, yeah. And then Piper, I liked the gray dress that she was wearing during the day at dinner with yeah. Lucas. Yeah. That was cute. Yeah, that was super adorable. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. Holy shit. Has Phoebe ever only had one outfit? Nope, this is the first episode that Holy Phoebe crap. only has one outfit. That's a revelation. Yeah, it's super weird. Okay. I don't know how I feel about it. Okay, so plug time? Yep. Okay. You can find us at pretty much all of the social media except LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> and Vine. We don't have and Vine. And Tinder. <laughs> We're obviously not on Grinder. That's not really our area of expertise. No, not so much. Um, we're not on OkCupid. Okay not as a podcast, anyway. But we're on Twitter, Tumblr. We have a Facebook page. Uh, we've got a Pinterest that we never use. I actually, Snapchat. I oh, actually did you use been, it? I have actually oh, been doing yay. Pinterest more because I wasn't you sure. Know. You mentioned it earlier, and I wasn't sure if you meant like you or the podcast. Yeah, no, I was on our Pinterest page okay. for, for That's a bit. That's good. Okay, so we have a Pinterest that we are now using. Yeah. Um, it's basically all charm stuff, but I'm trying very hard not to put in anything spoilery. You could always go the, like, aesthetic route. Yeah. Like, get a bunch of Athos and shit. Yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we're, we're working on it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so charmchats at gmail.com. Yeah, please charm email chats. us if you like. Yeah, we got our very first email. We got our very first email. Which is kind of amazing. We're not going to talk about it right now. We're still we're, waiting we're... on permission from the sender mm-hmm. to discuss it. Yeah. And hell, and then we will. Yeah, yeah. And heck if they... Heck, really? Really, Kendra? Hell, if they uh, get back to us. To if they get back to us before we have to publish this, maybe we'll put it in. So Maybe. We'll yeah. see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll, we'll play it by ear. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, so you can email us at charmchats at gmail.com. You can tweet at us at charmchatspod on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And there's also our Tumblr. Uh huh. Um, but then, everywhere else we're charmchats. Yep. Facebook, Instagram, Patreon. Mm hmm. Yes. Our second we, Tumblr. <laughs> we would love to be able to afford more storage because we're, we're kind of running out. Yes. Like, and we don't we, we don't want to take down the episodes from iTunes because then people won't be able I mean, to find them. Well, they'll be able to find them on our website, yeah. but they won't be able to find them all in one place. Other than the website. Other than the website. And that yeah. can be a little tedious, we understand, but, you know, we're, we don't make money from this. No. We barely make enough money to do our regular stuff. Yeah. And this is definitely a time-intensive and a work-intensive, and we put money into this kind of crap. Like, yes. We, we care about the podcast, and if you care about the podcast, it would be lovely if you would help us be able to afford to keep all of the podcast on iTunes, because that's where most of you listen to it, apparently. Yeah. As our poll told us. 
Yeah. Granted, there were, what, two boats? Yeah. But they were both high tunes. Yeah. So, but. Yeah. We don't have a large goal. We just like to be able to afford... We literally, we literally at this point, it. just are asking it, that if you enjoy the podcast, that you help us out so that we can afford bandwidth mm-hmm. to keep the podcast on iTunes. Yes. Bandwidth and storage. Yeah. Also, like, what are our alternatives? We join a podcast network and find sponsors? How, we Do we don't know how to do that kind of stuff? Yeah. And you How know, does that happen? It's magical. It's uh, mysterious. It's yeah. like, how are you dating? I don't know how that happens. <laughs> it's suddenly people are together, and I'm just like, what? Why? How? Even when I'm literally privy to the moment they start dating, which has happened, mm-hmm. I still don't know how it happened. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Kind of like algebra when I was in eighth grade. <laughs> you can show me the answers, you can show me the answers. I still don't know how to get to the answers. It's like me with analog clocks. Yeah. You can show me how to read it, and I'll know it for a moment, and then as soon as I look away, it's like the silence from Doctor Who. Yep. As soon as you turn your head, you forget. <laughs> <sighs> so yes, if so, you yeah. can, if you would like to, please you... contribute to our Patreon. Absolutely, because the only other thing I can think of is possibly setting up a GoFundMe account, Ooh, which that's... would be weird yeah. for yeah. a podcast, so that's yeah, why Patreon is a that. thing. Yeah, because but... generally our GoFundMe is like a once a thing. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I don't. I don't know that we're that desperate. Yeah. Well, wait, maybe at some point. Yeah. We might become that desperate. I don't know. We're not that desperate right now for crazy, but we we absolutely would enjoy <laughs> desperate, desperate. I am very desperate. Romeo, Romeo, where for out there, Romeo? Oh, okay. Sassy gay friend. Got it. That's old. Holy shit, that's old. Okay. Did you not watch those videos? I don't think so. We're gonna have to take you on a tour through that shit. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Continue with what you're saying. But yeah, we're we're not asking for a lot. Literally, if we can get $65 a month, which sounds like a lot, but it really isn't, mm. that would be enough for us to have enough bandwidth to not have to worry for the next three years. Yes. Especially if we find a more optimal hosting situation. Yeah. Because right now, I don't think we do. No. Nah. And remember, if you're contributing to us, if you're a patron, mm-hmm. you'll probably get some outtakes and shit. Yeah. Maybe some stuff about Blue. Yeah. You'll get a tangent that, you know, didn't make it into the podcast mm-hmm. because She's it happened. She's got a bunch of them stocked up. Trust yeah. me. Oh, yeah. Especially since we record a bit before we actually start the podcast, and all of that gets cut out, so... Mm-hmm. Because I don't like cold opens. <laughs> We're going to have to do cold opens for mm. whatever else we do. We're going to have to. I will force you to. Maybe. We'll see. I'll force you to. We'll see. Yeah. But I think that's us done for another week. We're not begging. We're only begging. <laughs> Basically, I don't want to have to do ads. Yeah. Like, I would rather be, be you know, fan-supported. I don't want to have to be like, buy this product and do this thing and use that. Like, no, I don't want to do any of that. Well, me here, I'm just like, hey, I want to be able to afford to do this, so I'll do ads. I'll do whatever kind of ad. I don't know. I probably won't do it for, like, sex toys or whatever, but... <laughs> Bras. I'd do it for bras. Oh my god, we talk about boobs so much. <laughs> we could do, like, ads for thinks or something, because we talk about periods a bunch. Yeah, those we have for not, fat people. We have not gotten through a single episode in a huge streak. I haven't counted, but, we like, I swear we have talked about periods and bras every episode. <laughs> Probably. We should probably be sponsored by, like, <laughs> Waco or something. <laughs> Waco? Waco. That's it. What's Waco? It's a bra company. Oh, all right. They make they make stuff I wear. Oh, all right. So they make bigger bras, but they probably don't make big, big, big bras. I don't know how big they make them. How do you spell that? W-A-Y, Coal. C-O-A-L, I think. Or it may be just W-A, Coal. Nah. Yes. Waco. Okay, should we maybe close this out before you go on a... All right. So that's us done for another week. Bye. Bye. Sleep tight. Don't let the warlocks bite. All right. Phoebe, Piper the Pooh, we've got evil to stay and some potions to brew. So we'll see where it's at next week with Kendra and